Uh, just advise members to welcome you to use the Wi-Fi connected mobile devices, uh, usual routine. Uh, I appreciate everybody. It's quite warm in here, and we've asked for the. We've got the windows open, so it should cool down a bit. But it is. Can we have the heat off, please. <laughs> off. Possible. Off. The heat, yes, off. I. Is it on? It's yep. Possibly. It's cooking. Yeah. Well, we have the windows open. If we can do something about doing the temperature arrangements in here. Um, <coughs> A revised draft agenda has been circulated today. If you have the opportunity, just have a quick look at that to make sure you're content. Because, Philip, in this committee, we do actually ask the committee members whether they're happy or not before we proceed. Find out Sometimes. <laughs> Are we content? OK. Content to proceed with the new agenda. Uh, moving on to item one, there are no apologies at present. However, uh, uh, Mr. Alistair has uh, said that he may be late, and if there is a particular vote, he's delegated his vote to me as the chairperson during this particular event. Yes, he's an audit committee. Could I just say that I hadn't expected to be here today? Uh, he normally allocates his vote to me or vice versa, but because I wasn't expected, I'm happy that he's delegated to yourself. Okay. And everybody else is here. Matthew's here. I'm disappointed he didn't allocate it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it in the family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, remind members who are obliged to claim any uh, relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting is applicable. No. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings of the proceedings on the 30th of September. Draft minutes are at page five. Members, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? If we are content, yes, and agreed the minutes will be published on the website. Uh, matters arising, departmental bids for capital and resource funding during the pandemic. A draft letter to the Executive Ministers regarding departmental bids for capital and resource funding is during is at page 11. Uh, the, email, the clerk, uh, uh, Jim, has emailed a copy of the template reference to the draft letter to members on Monday. Members, are we content? You won't have seen, uh, Philip, have you seen any of that yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Matthew. I just had a couple, uh, one or two comments on the drafting of the letter. I think there's a slight typo, but it's, I mean, it's a fairly small one. It is, um, I think, in the um, third paragraph. Um, uh, the sentence says, the committee recognises that the recent and unprecedented events have required how we, <coughs> as a society, deliver our functions within the necessary. So I, I, I just think there's, we could revisit that, because I think it's just a matter of, I'm not sure it's a, the, the, the meaning isn't clear. Otherwise, happy. Yeah, that, sure, that would, would re, uh, require changes to the way in which we, as a society, deliver our functions. The committee recognises that the recent unprecedented events have required how we, comma, as a society, comma, deliver our functions within the necessary constraints arising from the COVID pandemic. How would that work? Additional comma. Uh, well, I don't know what requires. Surely it has to requ what is it, What is it requiring? Required changes. Uh, I think Jim's suggestion is the one that you insert the word required changes to is makes more sense. It's just to, to clarify what the meaning is. I think it's just a small... OK. If we're content, just to put in the word changes, are we content? Agreed. Right. Thank you. And are we content to issue the letter and the template? Yep. Agreed. Uh, can we now move on to the oral presentation on Estonia, please? And can I invite Aidan to come on in? Are we OK? I can. Uh, read it. Okay. So as uh, as you said, Chair, I'm going to uh, do a quick presentation here on uh, e-government in Estonia. I have a little PowerPoint that I'll hopefully be able to share with you. Um, is that is that viewable? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So um, uh, today on the presentation, I'm going to focus on a number of things. Um, what makes Estonia's e-government unique? Um, how Estonia got to where it is today, um, some key technological principles that underpin a government in Estonia, some key issues that emerge from the Estonian case, but which are um, uh, 
which have relevance to to um, e government more generally, and then there'll be some time at the end for for questions. So. What is unique about uh, e-government in Estonia? Well, first of all, uh, in 2019, the European Commission um, ranked uh, Estonia second uh, for digital digital public services in the European Union. Now, I checked this this morning, and since the paper was written, this has been updated. So, as of 2020, it's it, uh, Estonia is ranked first. Um, so. Uh, the first thing that's unique about uh, e-government in Estonia is the range of public services on offer. Um, uh, there's a list of services on page 26 of your pack, um, but uh, I get the 99% of services are available online, and the agency e Estonia joke that only marriages, divorces, and property transactions require a physical presence. Um, this this has been a, pr a process of evolution. Um, the, the service has been put on incrementally over over a period of a number of years, from 1997 right up until 2019. Uh, the second uh, uh, unique factor is is uptake. Um, around 67% of the population uh, use their um, digital ID card to access e services on a regular basis. 98% um, of businesses uh, are formed online. 99% of prescriptions are digital and all schools use some form of um, e-solutions. And uh, the third unique factor is that it's a decentralized system. And I'll talk about this a little bit more when I'm addressing the sort of technological principles. Okay, so how did Estonia get there? Well, on pages 20 to 21 of your packs, there are a list of policy um, initiatives and legislative interventions that sort of underpin the um, Estonian uh, system. However, in the literature, um, there's, a sort of a, there's an agreement that um, the digital transformation cannot be pinned down to a single policy or legislative uh, intervention. There are some key uh, drivers that emerge from, from the different commentators. So first of all, uh, there's the political situation in Estonia. Estonia is a relatively new country, emerging out of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, this, this, sort of gave, this gave them a, 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 a clean slate, I suppose, to, to, to build upon. Um, the Soviet legacy is interesting because, on the one hand, the, there was a desire to escape um, sort of the, the heavy industrial past, but also um, earlier um, investments during the 1960s in, into computer science meant that there was a pool of uh, talent uh, available which fed into the, the private and public sectors. Um, also, on the political side of things, there has been a, a consistent uh, political will to see this transformation take place, and it has been supported by consecutive governments since the 1990s. From an economic perspective, um, the private sector has been uh, important, particularly uh, the finance and banking se se sectors, where um, innovations such as um, uh, on, uh, digital IDs for, for online banking have filtered into to the, the public sector sphere. Um, foreign direct investment has also been a significant driver. Um, so as, as Estonia opened up to its economy to the West, um, it received um, uh, investment from uh, Scandinavia in particular, which was a telecoms um, leader uh, at the time. And this has led to um, knowledge and technological transfers. From uh, a social perspective, the, the, the system uh, of e-government in Estonia is based on a, a social constant, contract or a consent model, whereby um, citizens um, allow access to the data um, in return for the convenience that the e-government systems provide them. Again, on the social aspect, uh, has taken uh, has has attempted to to uh, create a, a tech savvy population, and this has been achieved through um, education, both within a, a, a formal school setting, but also outside. Um, there's a legal framework that underpins this. Again, that's on page 21 of your packs, but uh, key um, to this are the uh, the, the legal uh, interventions which have um, protected digital identities and um, also personal data. And finally, there's um, the technological principles, uh, which I'll, get, I'll come back to in a, in a minute. But before I do, I just want to address the issue of cost. Um, unfortunately, there's no clear answer to the question of how much uh, Estonia's transformation uh, cost. In 2018, the European Commission um, looked at the Estonia and concluded that there is not and largely cannot be any official or even unofficial estimation of the overall budget used. 
Um, however, the same assessment did find that um, uh, it received the new significant uh, EU money. There's details of that on page 27 of your packs. Um, Estonia prioritised 1% of its annual budget for ICT development between 1994 and 2004. And uh, currently the government information system costs between 50 million euros to 60 million euros uh, a year. And that's less than 1% of the, the country's uh, 8 billion euro annual budget. So underpinning the, um, the system of e-government in Estonia are uh, seven um, principles, uh, technological principles. Um, these include decentralization. So essentially there's no central database. Um, individual departments are responsible for strategy and, and IT systems. And this allows for innovation and it also allows different departments to create the systems that best suit their needs. The second principle is interconnectivity. All, and that's basically that all um, systems should be able to exchange data securely and smoothly. Um, then there's the principle of integrity, which ensure, uh, it's, it's essentially that systems are protected and secure. Then there's the open platform system, which uh, whereby um, systems are open source. That means they're not tied to any priority um, software or hardware, and they're usable by any institution that would um, desire to use them. Um, there's a no legacy principle, whereby um, they're not tied to, into old and outdated systems. Uh, the once only principle, and but this principle holds that um, uh, a citizen should only have to enter uh, a data point uh, once, and then it's shareable across the whole system. And finally, there's the issue of uh, the principle of transparency. Um, essentially, citizens have the right to see their personal information and check how it's, uh, the government are using it. So uh, these is, this, those principles are, I, I suppose, somewhat uh, contradictory. And to make the whole thing um, work together, um, the, the use, the, they've employed a tech, technological solution um, known as X Road. Now, essentially, this is how the uh, decentralized system exchanges data. It's a distri distributed data exchange layer which links all the databases together through end to end crypt encrypted pathways. This means that no data is essentially held, rather, it's stored uh, locally within individual um, uh, organization databases. However, um, the user um, experiences it as a unified whole, um, uh, and the, the principle of sharing across the system allows for the, the once only um, principle to be maintained. A second uh, key technological solution is the ID cards. Uh, these were introduced in 2001, and they're, they're mandatory. Um, the, the act is a unique identifier that enables access to e-services, and they're backed by a legal framework uh, this is twofold. On the one hand, uh, the digital signature is legally equivalent to a handwritten signature, which ensures that transactions can be uh, that can, can take place online. And secondly, it's a it's a criminal offence to access and use another person's digital signature. Uptake of the the ID card is ninety eight percent, which is perhaps unsurprising given that it's mandatory. And sixty seven percent of users uh, or of, of ID card holders regularly use it to access digital services online. So last slide, um, I just want to draw, draw your attention to some um, issues uh, for consideration that sort of emerge out of the Estonian experience, but um, have, uh, have are, are, are important uh, in, in, in a general sense. First of all, there's the issue of cybersecurity. So essentially by putting um, uh, all, all government services onto uh, digital platforms, it opens up the, the possibility or enhances, the, increases the possibility of cyber attack. Um, this was experienced by Estonia in 2007 and led to uh, changes to their security measures, um, introducing new measures, um, new government agencies, um, developing international links and uh, backing up uh, the, their data on out-of-state uh, uh, data servers, which are, are referred to as data embassies. Second is the issue of, of data, data ethics. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the Estonian system operates on a consent model uh, where citizens um, provide access to their data in exchange for the convenience of digital public services. Um, the Estonian Personal Data Act um, gives citizens the right to um, access all personal data held by government, make changes to that data and restrict 
and, and withdraw um, consent for that data to be used either on a departmental by depart, uh, basis or overall. Um, so the reason I bring this up is that uh, there, there could be questions about how this could translate to a, a Northern Ireland context. The, the House of Commons um, Science and Technology Committee looked at this issue in uh, uh, in, in, in relation to Estonia and, and how it would transfer to the uh, to a UK sense. And they noted a, a societal barrier of mistrust among citizens with regard to how government used data. Um, so the next uh, issue is uh, for consideration, I suppose, is uh, the, the issue of um, equitable access. Um, so the d d digital divides exist within the society, meaning that um, not all uh, individuals have equal access to the to, to internet uh, technologies, nor do all individuals have um, equal capabilities with using those technologies. Um, for example, in, uh, Northern Ireland has the, the, high, the highest proportion of individuals in the UK who have never accessed uh, the internet. And across uh, the uh, UK, digital divides exist um, along a number of social characteristics such as age, um, economic status, um, whether a person uh, has a disability or not, um, somewhat in, in gender and somewhat across uh, ethnicity lines. So I, I guess it's an issue because if, if you're trying to develop uh, a new government solution, uh, considering consideration should probably be to how you can ensure that um, uh, society as a whole can come along with that transformation and that people aren't disenfranchised from from public services. So that's that's the oh, wrong way. That's uh, all I wanted to say, uh, Chair. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Aidan, uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for a comprehensive uh, briefing. Um, a couple of issues I just want to sort of touch in before I invite some of the other people to come in as well. Obviously, it's the, the 2001, I think it was the digital ID card, and the fact that every Estonian citizen had to sign up to get services actually had to have the digital card. Now, the implication for that was, of course, is that at the end, when the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was no structure for it to, it to sign in. They were starting from afresh. So is there any more information you can give us about sort of how the acceptance of the digital ID card was uh, originally came to the fore? And uh, having been in Estonia myself, I think it was in 2001, one of the big issues were that uh, people of, who identified themselves as Estonian all went and took the, out the digital ID cards, but those who still identified themselves as Russian or ethnic Russian didn't. And you had to basically be fluent in Estonian to actually get through onto the, the card. So could you just give us a view of, uh, from any sort of new research you've seen on the update of the ID card? Uh, the other issue is... Uh, Obviously, how closely is this GDPR compliant, and how, when we're trying to look at things like blockchain and cybersecurity issues to prevent it being um, either mass attacked or whatever it happens to be, what degree of control do the citizenry feel as if they have over some of these issues? And those are just sort of the two sort of uh, top level issues. Uh, and I just wonder if you picked up any of those in your research. Sure, those are both uh, very, very, very good questions. Um, unfortunately, I d it's, it's, it's always a difficulty when you're looking at uh, 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 regions outside the UK which aren't, aren't uh, English speaking. That it, it's it can be difficult to get uh, a, a great level of detail on on things. Um, with so uh, the GDPR issue is is not something that, that the paper looked at, but it is something I would happily. Um, and come back to you on the the, the issue of um, of uptake of the ID cards and, and trust more generally. This was looked at um, by the um, the House of Commons uh, Science and Technology um, Committee, and um, if I can just find the reference, essentially um, there was two witnesses to that committee had two schools of thought. One was that. Um, that, that people in the UK don't trust how the government might use the data. But other witnesses um, argued that um, trust is something that you build up and uh, the um, the actual development of these e-services um, on a slow incremental basis um, 
allowed for the Estonian government to to establish that trust um, with with uh, with their, their populace. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that especially answers your question, Chair. Okay, no, that, that's fine. Sorry, you broke up there, Jim. Um, that's very useful, very interesting, uh, and the parallels between Estonia and Northern Ireland are, are quite striking. But you made two fundamental points uh, that differentiate the two countries. First of all, 85% of the investment came through the European Union. Now, since we have lost object, Objective 1 status and are obviously about to leave the European Union, um, we could not access that type of funding and never did, actually. So that is the first question. Could it have been done without that? And secondly, you have a 98% uptake of identity cards. And I think you're very well aware of the attempt, the failed attempt in the UK to introduce these, uh, and uh, that was scrapped at a huge cost to the taxpayer. So, could a similar model be rolled out in Northern Ireland, given a lack of money and the absence of ID cards? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, the, 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 the honest answer is I, 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 I wouldn't be able to confidently say. However. Um, the, the department have um, provided a, a, a submission that uh, follows my paper in the PACs, and they've they've in that they give their opinion about how transferable um, the system would be across to to Northern Ireland. And the, and the, the, the other question I, I have to ask: I mean, I think you know it would cost a small fortune to do what the Estonians have done, which has been very admirable, and, and they've achieved an awful lot. But that leads on to my next question is, if you have everything reliant upon the internet and some malcontent was to seize the system, this is not entirely um, mythical because you remember what happened to the national health computers which were attacked mm -hmm. about three years ago and how one of the leading um, trans money transfer companies was almost destroyed when its system, which was meant to be foolproof, was hacked and led to... to to loss of billions of pounds, indeed to the ultimate blackmail, uh, uh, demanding billions of pounds worth of currency and Bitcoin. Um, what happens if your system fails when you have so many eggs in that one basket and no, presumably no paper backup? Well, um, that, that, that certainly opens you up to new vulnerabilities. The more um, the more that you that you move your system to a digital to, to a digital basis. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, this did actually occur in, in, in Estonia, where in 2007 they, they were victim to a cyber attack and they lost services um, for, for a time. Um, one way they've, uh, they, they've, they've, they've been, one thing they've implemented to uh, prevent this is to back up all the information um, out, out of state in, in, in the data embassies. And they've also beefed up um, security more general. So I think it's, it's, it's about... Um, uh, ensuring that you have robust um, cybersecurity measures in place and um, and, 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 and it's robust cybersecurity measures in place and in and and, and ways of of, of, of and a plan B essentially is what I'm trying to get at um, a, a backup um, to to the, the main system. I thought we were going to have an IT failure there because I thought we were going to lose you, which sort of rather made my point. Which would be, ironic, um, as you say. Uh, the, the other problem is my definition of old age is 64. Next year it'll be 65. <laughs> and I think I'm very much on the margins between those who find this whole digital approach acceptable and easy to run and those who find it impossible. I have a seven year old uh, nephew who can, is certainly more proficient at IT than I am. And that's absolutely true. He, he's absolutely brilliant. So how do, you, how do you deal with the fact that in your figures you've shown that the number of people, elderly, i.e. over 63, who are, haven't got access to the internet or are proficient at it, is 25%. So are you then not in danger of leaving a large and significant element of your community behind you in all of this who simply don't get it and can't get it? It's, it's a very good point. That's the point I was trying to draw out there. There are... There are um, there, there are dangers um, uh, that people get become disenfranchised, and it's not it's not just about the age. In, in in Northern Ireland, it's also about um, where people are are based. There's a, there's a difference in the the average download speeds. For example, people can get 
in rural areas compared to urban areas. Um, with with Estonia, uh, one of the the key um, key initiatives to to uh, to improve, to, not to improve, to to um, enhance uh, citizen capability was, was was through education. So uh, starting at sc at school level, but also uh, going out into um, non school environments such as public libraries and and teaching people um, how they can how they can use the public services. But it is a very good point and something that's it, it, it's, it's really um, fundamental to allow, uh, enabling something like this to be successful is, is taking people along with you. But the download speeds between the two countries aren't that far apart. In, in, in Estonia, it's 61.61 MPS, having a clue what that is, whilst in Northern Ireland, it's 55. So the difference is only about, what, 10, 12 per cent of a difference. So, uh, but that would disguise the fact that in our major towns and cities with excellent coverage, but when you get to somewhere like Kilkeel or, or, or Rufraland or somewhere, to quote totally random examples, uh, it gets much, much lower than that. And therefore, you not only exclude people on the basis of their age, but also on the basis of their location. So it's OK when you've got fibre cables going to every rural part of, of your country, but you will leave elderly rural dwellers behind and they will be denied uh, access to, 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 to services. There are many banks uh, and financial institutions at the moment that elderly can't access because they only give you an internet option. So, I mean, surely that means that Northern Ireland is going to have to remain with a hybrid model for many years to come. Uh, it, I, I agree that it is it needs to be, to be considered uh, and, and addressed and, and you, uh, it will inform um, the, the extent to which Northern Ireland um, can can um, can implement such a model. Um, so on on the issue of internet speed, so uh, as of two thousand and eight, um, uh, urban areas had essentially twice the the, the speed uh, of rural areas on average. Um, so there has been there's been considerable broadband investment over a decade in Northern Ireland to try to improve this, and I, I don't have the figures on to hand on this, but I can provide them with the committee. But also, uh, there, there's a, uh, the, the Department for the Economy is, um, is 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 in the process of launching what's known as Project Stratum, which is a 165 million pound um, uh, project uh, to enhance connectivity across Northern Ireland and to target those areas where speeds aren't uh, aren't so great. Um, uh, and that contract is to uh, is due to be awarded in in mid October. So I think there's there's it's a very real issue. And I don't want to on uh, on to downplay uh, the issue of um, digital um, divides in, in in society in general. But um, I think it's something that that there are steps being taken to to try to improve improve that. Okay. Okay. I Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, most common uh, queries from a constituency point of view to me as a rural MLA is broadband uh, speed. It's just fallen on from Jim. Uh, but I mean, I do note that Project Stratum, uh, you know, d does intend to target uh, at the very least 98 per cent of the population of the north with uh, if it gets the go ahead uh, and works out as planned. I mean, I thought the report was very interesting. Uh, I mean, it certainly uh, clearly identifies benefits to society in terms of uh, ease of doing something. You know, it would be interesting maybe to get an analysis of an economic benefit from doing business this way. I mean, I, I would suspect that uh, Estonia. I mean, moving towards e-government and certainly the North moving towards e-government probably means loss of jobs of people currently providing the service not through uh, an e-government system. So, I mean, is there any analysis of either the positive benefits of doing business this way economically uh, and also is there any analysis of maybe potential job losses if the North was to move towards a form of e-government? Um. I, the, uh, with regards to Estonia, the European Commission analysis did touch upon um, some of the economic benefits that, that, that is delivered. So, for example, um, the, it's led to a 2% saving of G, GDP through the use of digital signatures. Um, 84, sorry, 
844 years of working time received annual through the use of annually through the use of data exchange and the time to establish a business in Estonia has reduced from five days to three hours. Now, the job losses uh, uh, and the impact on jobs is not something that, that I have covered in the paper. Um, uh, it, is, it is something that I'll certainly look at if, if the committee would like me to. Well, any more? No, I mean, I think that would be interesting. I mean, there's, I think, you know, if you were, if we were a committee were intend to pursue it, it would be important that we would know the impact uh, in terms of jobs. I think just um, sort of speaking from the chair here, but one of the issues with Estonia is basically because they had nothing to build on and they were actually doing it at the point where technology married with a service they needed to provide and that was a method of providing it. So one of the things we might be interesting if we want to do some more work on this is indeed probably talk to sort of do some more discussions with uh, Estonia itself, get a, a, a view on sort of how they, how they built it, because indeed, you know, if you start from nothing, it's actually quite an easy, it's probably an easier prospect than actually trying to graft it on top of a system. Paul, a couple of questions. Yeah, I find this actually quite fascinating. I think it was myself that first raised the whole Estonia, Estonia and uh, e government uh, concept, and, and I did, I, I yearned for more uh, information on it. I must say that I, it surprises me even the, the level of which e-government have, has actually in, in, encapsulated the country. Uh, I get the point that it started from scratch and it had the opportunity then to build a model that suited, uh, I suppose if you like, like a doomsday book scenario where they were able to start afresh and start registering people. But I think that's where I, I would get nervous about it. So when I look at e-government, what does it mean to me? It means efficient services for public. It doesn't really mean universal information exchange for, for individual freedoms. Now, what I mean by that is, is on, point, on page 38.4.2, uh, data ethics, uh, you have a line in there that states citizens willingly give the state full access to their data yeah. in return for the convenience and benefits of accessing the majority of public services online. To me, that should be a God-given right, nearly to, to get convenient government, and that should be government doing its best efficiently, working well for the population. To me, that should never ever be a quid pro quo. That should never be an exchange or a deal. Uh, citizens of any country should just accept and, and expect that to a certain degree. So the thought of we'll make a deal, it sort of strikes me as something out of The Godfather, where Vito Carloni tells his henchmen to go and <laughs> offer a local businessman a deal that he can't refuse. Uh, so I would worry about that aspect. So I suppose my question is, Aiden, is there, is there given, given that Northern Ireland's fabric exists, and given Estonia started from scratch, is there a hybrid position whereby you, you really quick time and make efficient all the government departments and uh, facilities, but you, you, you retain the individual freedom and the personal privacy of your own data? That's, to me, that's the utopia of the Estonia model if it could ever be manufactured that way. Okay, um, so I think maybe uh, I could have been a bit more careful with my wording on that point. Um, so what I'm trying, really, what I was really trying to get to is that uh, citizens, the citizens um, provide their data and allow it to be accessible across the, citizen, the system, which um, in, which means you know it's, it's, it's shared right across and then they only have only have to enter, um, say, their date of birth once, and then it'll, it'll be equally accessible at um, by the health service and by the the MOT department, for example. But um, uh, more more generally, um, I think th there is also protections in there um, through the Data Protection Act, which um, allows them to withdraw and um, uh, see how the data has been used. But I think on your on your general point um, about um, a hybrid um, uh, and, and and starting. From a different position, um, I, 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 I've, I've only looked at the Estonian Estonian model, but um, it, it, 
so there are definitely there, there there must be lessons that can be learned from from how they've got there, even though we're starting from a different place. And if, if you do, if you if you refer to the um, the, the department's um, submission, you, you can see that they have um, uh, have been attempting to do that. And I think I, I believe, um, if, I, if I correctly recall, the submission that they, they that they have actually been in in uh, contact with with Estonia and have have, have tried to seek learning from from that. It strikes me that. If you can separate the population with government, because I, I get what the committee in, in Westminster, uh, what their findings, I, I, I agree with that and I accept that concept altogether. And it's actually a really healthy thing to have a distrust in your government. It, it really is. It really is a very healthy thing. So to me, there needs to be a separation between the general public and the efficient machinery and workery, workery of the government. And what I think I'm talking about when I talk about e-government, I think I'm talking about joined-up government, whereby we use electronic and technology to, to actually ensure that there's information shared across government departments to make it more efficient for the, for the population. Now, we don't need to create a new, we don't create, need to create a new wheel with regards to an ID card when we all have national insurance numbers. Uh, we all have our unique data, our date of birth, our name and address. So, so surely we do not need to start from scratch in that and invent, reinvent the wheel. Whenever there's, there's data out there that can be used and shared between departments that actually produce something really efficient for the safeguards and the efficiency of the population. Um, I'm, I'm not. It's it's, it's a good. Uh, they're really good questions. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure how to respond because really we're getting into sort of design issues that um, yeah. would really be beyond the scope of what uh, what, what what the paper was about and, and beyond the scope of my current knowledge. Um, apologies for that. No, it, it strikes me just to finish, chair. That it strikes me that it's very good that the health department could well be in line and hit a button and gain access from, from you know, I think you used the MOT centre. There may be, may be numerous reasons why a doctor may require information like that. Uh, may not, but he may need that. And, and, and that will build a bigger picture to, to ascertain your health an individual's health. So that's a good thing that the doctor, probably more people trust the doctor than they do government. So you understand how this could actually work quite effectively for the person. It just doesn't have to be that they give up that fundamental freedom and right of having their data captured and then shared, if you know what I mean. So whilst I'm very nervous about the whole concept of, and, and I will guard religiously my f the individual freedoms, I still think there's a place for e-government. It may look something different, but it should be looked upon, the Estonia model, and worked on and, and improved upon. I suppose my last question, and I, I suppose I, I have my tongue a wee bit in my cheek, is what do the Russians think of this? Because they probably <laughs> know more about it than the Estonians. <laughs> Again, I, I, that's beyond the scope of, of the paper. Uh, Thank you. It, it, it might be a popular point in this committee, but the issue is that's why the Estonians are so closely wedded to NATO, because yeah. of course that's where Absolutely. their cyber security centre is. Yeah. It's in Estonia. And the reason for that is that they view their critical vulnerability as what Russia can do with their systems. And the European Union, of course, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I know when you started off with of the people for the people, I thought you were getting all Joe Biden on me, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Deputy Chair. If that was a bit. Ah, Thanks very much. Thanks for your presentation. And it definitely was one of the better <laughs> reports that I have read. I've enjoyed reading it. Yeah. Um, just to answer probably Paul's question, what I had taken out of it was the Estonian experience had a series of cyber attacks in 2007 in that report, and the blockchain technology was developed to ensure you know, that the data stored in the government uh, uh, repositories were to protect that data against each other. And then when you move on down, it's that uh, when you make that payment, that sits as one payment. We've cut out that complete middleman. 
and that payment is set there until that database is linked up with every other database before that money is released. So for that, I have to say that it has moved beyond what we are even talking about. Mm. Um, I want to go back to the point that you made, Chair, uh, as well, but before I do that, this to me is really advanced stuff. Estonia has now reached an unprecedented level of transparency and governance and built broad trust in a digital society. 30% of Estonians use iVoting, 90% of the public services are available online 24-7. Furthermore, 90% of Estonian bank transactions and 95% of its tax declarations are now filed online, which brings me to my question. Um, a few questions just. Uh, our DSS have made comment about how good the Northern Ireland uh, Direct is and how more sisters are coming online. Um, I'm making the point here that during this time of COVID, it was difficult in order to use our local website in order to get information if anyone tried it. So that's one point that I'm trying to make. So there is work to be done on it. Uh, this might not be good uh, to go to what the Chair's point was. There has to be some way that we in this committee can learn more about this. Either it be, uh, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll take it from the clerk. There has to be some way that there may not be a costing, but we need to see this at first time and operate at first time, because I believe this is the way to go forward. And part of our research, as we do in here, is transformation of the civil service. There's a lot of points here in order to try to try and do that. Uh, one of the key elements is about the axe road system in Estonia. And um, can you tell me how do those databases? Uh, after the 2007 uh, cyber attack, what is the linkage? Do you know the linkage of how they can communicate to each other and how that is open to the general public? Because anyone can go on it and, and read off that database and see where that money is and see where that payment is. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, so, if you go if you go back to, to the. Um, the, 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 the actual diagram. Um, each each interaction is security uh, uh, is security protected, um, and only, uh, data permissions are given. Uh, I believe um, only on the basis that they're needed. So, for example, um, medical data will only be seen by the doctors that um, uh, need to see that medical data, and it's the citizen has has, has final um, say of of, uh, of of how the permissions are given. Um, is, is, that, is that the sort of thing you're getting at there? Sorry. Um, That's okay, but maybe sure. I can follow that up with you later. Would that be all right, sir? Would that be okay? Yeah, but, yeah. but the other one just was the point in how, how is, there, is there a method that we can see this, either by inviting someone from the Estonian government to come in and give us a Zoom? For me personally, it would be better first hand. Okay. To the chair, is there a mechanism that that can be done? Taking in mind that we're in uh, the pandemic at the moment, but when that lifts, uh, I think sort of uh, when we're finished with Aidan, so I think we'll just wrap up and we'll have raise some of the issues that. here. Right. But Melissa, do you want to come in? Yeah, uh, just thank you for your presentation. She, um, the digital inclusion team. Just how um, important uh, is the digital inclusion team and in all of us? Just for you, have actually alluded there to materials and that that they had developed that were used both in the, the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland uh, to uh, encourage uh, older people to participate and to engage on the net. And you actually allude to the point as well too that uh, they had assisted. In the rural areas, what type of assistance did they actually give there? Uh, was that in terms of the extension of broadband or what? Uh, uh, you're, um, so you're talking from a Northern Ireland context there? Sorry, what no, I was saying we, no, I think uh, Melissa was saying from the Estonian context, what was the... No, actually, okay. the digital, she says here in one of the paragraphs, just the digital inclusion team developed online material and resources were used across Northern Ireland and Ireland to help older people get online and to assist those in rural areas. To assist uh, them in what way? Uh, apologies, I, I don't 
I don't think that's from my paper. It's maybe from the department submission. No. Is this the thing called? Sorry. No, it wasn't from this paper. It was from the department submission, I think. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you, um, Melissa, do you want us to ask that question of the department? Yeah, we can do. Yeah. Yeah, if we can do that. Okay. Um, if there's any others, well, th Aidan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And I can say, on behalf of Pat and indeed for the rest of us, it has indeed been one of the better presentations we have received, and actually is one of the most interesting we have received. But thank you very much indeed for your work, and thank you very much thank indeed you. for that. Thank you. Um, uh, committee, we've had a. I think it's this has spiked a lot of interest amongst the committee, and particularly the importance if we're looking for digital transformation. And there are a lot of questions that I think this is raised rather than uh, as well as answered. I think it's appropriate that uh, we consider we can continue to consider this issue and not ever wanting to be on record of recommending any form of sort of political tourism, but and particularly during the time of COVID. But can I take as an action with the um, with Jim as the clerk? to investigate some opportunities of getting some more information from the Estonian government and to look at either doing something specifically by Zoom or scoping out any other sort of alternatives we may we may have. I would imagine it would probably take some time for us to do this, but if you are content as an action for myself as the chair and the clerk to do that and do some more investigation on that on your behalf, and we will report back to you if you are content, Melissa. Just to the chair, uh, uh, apart from say uh, having additional information in relation to how uh, it was developed now in Estonia, in what other way can we, would say, as a finance committee, then take a project like this forward if we decide that it is something similar we hope to achieve here uh, on the island? Mm. I think the interesting thing is because one of the things we're looking at the forward work strand is. Uh, how we're going to look at the sort of the reform of the civil service, how we look at the reform programme, how we are become much more effective and efficient and operating. But my own experience of Estonia when I was there in 2001, they were starting with a completely blank piece of paper. They had to create services, they had to create it, and this was the easiest way to do it. We're in a different situation, is where we have a lot of existing services, and I take um, uh, Philip's point quite clearly is that one of the big issues with the Estonians, it wasn't a question of people, um, you know, as efficiencies of trying to reduce the number of jobs and costs and the rest of it. There wasn't anybody there to start off with. So that was one of the issues. So it's one of the things we, we need to take a consideration of. And one of the things, as we look towards this transformation of how we deliver the future of uh, public services in Northern Ireland, we also need to engage potentially with the unions as well to look at how these sort of these issues might 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 look. Sir Pat, I'm um, sure, yes. Um, for me, one of those key elements on that report is like that axe road system and how it allows, you know, different databases to talk to one another. Yeah. This is something I think anyhow we're terrible at here. Okay, well, you know, we're not good at it. But I mean to learn just something more on how that operates on a safe basis and how they built that on from two oh seven is something that we should go forward and look forward for with, with, with trust because they've already done this. This has been done and it's been delivered. It's been delivered from what it said by the amount of, of, of the advanced, how, how much Estonia is using it. Um, may I also make a suggestion through the committee, um, bearing in mind that Northern Ireland is this, one of the global centres of cyber security, and particularly what is work has been done at Queen's and sort of Catalyst Inc. Uh, may we also do a bit of research through the Clark, if it might be possible for somebody from uh, Catalyst Inc. to come and talk to us about the importance of cyber security and X road and delivery of public services, because I think that would be quite an appropriate uh, way to do that, and also a good opportunity for us to highlight the excellence that is here in Northern Ireland, if we are content with that. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, team. Uh, if we move on to the next item, we are our oral presentation on dilapidation payments, and we are inviting uh, Eileen to come and see us. Come on in, Eileen. How are you? Hello. What page? Um, team, we have been quite. A, we've dilapidation has been something that's been of some interest to this committee. Uh, 
over our sort of months in existence. And I think one of the things that we probably want to do is get a, a much better understanding of how we seem to be able to go from one figure to another figure, then a much substantially reduced figure in a particular period of time. And there seems to be a degree of pattern in it, or maybe there isn't, because uh, we're probably not sufficiently aware of it and the rest of it. Uh, the Department of Finance and Dilapidation Claims, an overview, raised briefing papers at page 52. And I, would you care to sort of make your presentation, please? Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak to you about uh, dilapidation claims taken against DOF in the period of 2016 to early September 2020. Um, there's a few things that I want to point out to you before I delve into providing you with the background and then looking at some of the data. First, it's very important to realize that the information that I'm sharing is not legal advice, obviously, and that it doesn't concern any specific circumstance or particular individual. Um, and if legal advice is required, um, appropriate representation. The other caveat is because a lot of this information, particularly the DOF data, is not available anywhere else, there's a heavy reliance in the briefing upon that data, so it's DOF sourced. Um, having said that now, what I'm going to do for you is set out um, some context setting information so that the committee is better placed to understand some introductory points about uh, commercial leasing, how such claims are brought, damages, um, resolving them, as well as some key law in the jurisdiction of Northern Ireland and related guidance. Before I move on to pointing out to you DOF business areas responsible for the claims and some relationships that they have with DSO and the procedures, practices and policies. So there's a number of things to go through in order to set up and under, to have a meaningful understanding of the data that has been shared by DOF. So if we start at the very beginning, commercial leasing um, obviously uh, is between the landlord and the tenant and there's a signed lease agreement between the parties. And amongst other things, they include a number of um, obligations and requirements. Um, and two of them that are of particular significance in this in dilapidation claims concerns the covenants about repair, maintain, and decorating, as well as to remove and um, alterations in any fill out that has been done. And this usually is done in and around the time of the lease uh, termination or after. Um, it's important to understand that there's a number of ways in, um, in which these um, what claims come about, but basically um, the landlord alleges a loss, the tenant, um, for reasons that the tenant has failed to comply with his obligations, and um, that's where the provisions within the lease concerning repair and reinstatement come into effect. But it's very important to understand, um, looking at different sources, it, um, it, a prominent law firm in Northern Ireland particularly, it, it's not unusual for um, those provisions concerning repair and reinstatement that they're unusual or that they're actually ambiguous. And you'll see why that is a lot of the problem where it centers upon. Um, so you have uh, three ways to resolve dilapidation days, dilapidation claims. You may have it where the liability is an in dispute and the landlord and the tenant come to an agreement after negotiation, and it's usually agreed by professional surveyors. Um, and those surveyors are appointed by each party. So that's nice and clean, easy, straightforward. Then you have um, liability that isn't disputed, but there's a provisional agreement that can't be agreed between the parties. That's the one that the surveyors put forward. And it can't be agreed because when legal advice was sought it was found maybe there was an issue. I mean, could you just move a bit over towards the microphone? Yes. You just slide sure. over. So we're just having difficulty picking up your excellent sort of uh, information. Is that okay now? That's much better. I yeah. apologize. So um, as I said, the first way, there's no dispute, it's settled after the professional surveyors um, come to an agreement and then the parties agree and there's a payment. And it goes through a series of steps, which I'll come on to in time. Where liability isn't disputed, but a provisional agreement between the surveyors can't be agreed, then it moves on to um, another phase where they get legal advice. And the legal advice reveals that um, they shouldn't be agreeing and certain um, experts are secured in order to progress it 
further. And the aim of um, this scenario is obviously settling the claim um, instead of issuing legal proceedings. But eventually, then, it does come to some resolution. Um, then you move on where there's liability denied by the tenant, either in part or in whole, and um, it, there can't be agreement. And it's, usually, it's based on legal advice. And um, it may be that they, uh, they find that there's some dispute about um, maybe interpretation of certain provisions under the lease, or they just don't believe that there's um, been that um, quantum of loss. And um, it all centers on the alleged breach of the covenants. But again, I remind you, there is that issue about how those provisions are framed within the lease. And legal proceedings then are lodged. Um, and obviously, throughout, there's legal advice. Um, but once the legal proceedings are lodged, it could resolve through settlement or um, before it goes into the court or while it's in the court or the court may um, say that you have to go to mediation and direct it. There's a trend um, within the jurisdiction that um, few cases are litigated and that they usually are resolved at mediation. Um, it's also very important, which I'll come on to later, is um, these types of claims, they're fraught with complexity. And again, coming back to the clauses and the provisions in the lease, as well as just their nature and that there's a lot of back and forth in order to come going through various steps. And something very important is that there's limited legislative provision in the jurisdiction um, and things not having been tested. So I'll come on to that later on. Um, Looking at the law and the related guidance, in relation to the law, you have the legislation um, and the two pieces of legislation governing dilapidation claims is the Conveyancing Act 1881 and the Business Tenancies Northern Ireland Order 1996. I'm on page four of the briefing, if that helps. Um, that sets out the fundamentals. It's important to note, unlike England and Wales, um, there's no statutory limit on landlord provisions, uh, but the common law principles apply. But it's important to realize in this jurisdiction, um, because these cases aren't litigated that much, um, there's not much case law. So we tend to rely on English precedents, and within the jurisdiction, they're only persuasive. They're not binding. So there are things that are untested, for example, in relation to damages and the application of the common law rules. Um, in particular, that damages are reasonable and proportionate to the loss. Um, and there's been some cases that have been um, filtering through the departmental system, which is influencing the approach within the department going forward and will in future. Um, the department advises that it will consider the circumstances in each dilapidations claim. Um, if there's evidence to show that there's been no loss suffered or reduced loss suffered by the landlord, and they will challenge. Um, but obviously, there has to be evidence. So if there, there has to be evidence, that protracts the whole process because they have to adduce the identify and adduce it. Um, and it's done on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously. In terms of legislation, I'm sorry, in terms of guidance that this jurisdiction relies upon, there's the Royal Institute of Ch Chartered Surveyors. They have a dilapidations guidance note, and it's written for English, um, the English system, but it's re recognized as a protocol within the jurisdiction. And amongst other things, it, ex it explains um, how the alleged breach and the related landlord costs from remitting should be set out, and it's something called a schedule of dilapidations, and it's done at the beginning. Um, and it's basically an itemization list of all the major repair, maintenance, and decoration items that the landlord alleges, um, probably his surveyor, alleges to have been um, uh, arising under the lease. And there is a recent article that observed, um, I think it was in June 2020, that schedules of dilapidations often are the cause of disputes between the landlords and the tenants and result in court action. Um, 
but that it's important to realise that it's in both parties' interests to avoid it, so to find some way to resolve the dispute. So now, moving on against that backdrop, um, we have the business area responsible for dilapidations claims in the DOF is the Estates Management Unit. It's a part of the Property Services Division of the Department's Enterprise Shared Services, and it's guided by various departmental policies, practices, and procedures. And importantly, they liaise at critical times with the Departmental Solicitor's Office and engage um, frequently with the lease management working group that has a membership that consists of um, DOF and DSO officials, as well as now I understand, and this may have been in the past as well, um, SIB, AMU people, Assets Management Unit. Um, you can see in your briefings on, from pages 7 through 9, they like, basically list steps or considerations, for lack of a better way to frame it. Um, and what they, what, they are all ta what they all are geared towards is resolving these disputes. Um, you can see there's various passing of information between DOF, DSO, the working group, the surveyors, solicitors, experts, and there's lots of back and forth within the departments, as well as back and forth then with the landlords, and then the landlords are back and forth between their surveyors and their solicitors. Um, so it's not surprising that given the number of um, the players involved on each side, that these um, can be protracted interactions. Um, out of this, this list that we can see on pages seven to nine, um, and the steps are framed with the law and the, uh, the protocol in mind, the RICS. But the critical things that we want to focus on in relation to all of this is that they're geared to um, work to certain things. The date the claim comes in, you have the dilapidation schedule. Mm -hmm. Then they're looking at the date to agree a dilapidation amount. But it's important to realize the surveyors agree that not, it's not on legal advice. So then it has to move on to the solicitor, um, and they step in and they do um, an assessment and provide their advice, but they must ensure due diligence. And with the issue of damages that I mentioned earlier, this obviously will take time to adduce the evidence in order to see um, if, there, if, it's, um, if there is um, a reasonable sum being offered. Um, the solicitors step in, so if they eventually give their um, green light, so to speak, um, then a deed of release is drafted up and agreed between the parties and then the claim is paid. Um, it's important to realize that there's very distinct roles for the EM, the, in DOF, for the EMU, for the DOS, and for the working group, as well as the surveyors. Um, they all have to do certain things to progress the, the resolution of the claim. Um, as I said earlier, if it gets, if there's dispute and disagreement, it's going to take even longer because it goes through legal proceedings or through mediation. Um, and where there's no prospect of settlement between the parties, it may be for a variety of reasons. And again, I come back to the issues of damages or ambiguous lease provisions. Um, for example, there have been cases where um, losses were alleged and the um, by the landlord and it was then found that it was planning permission for um, demolition of the building or there was immediate um, tenancy following the, vac the vacating of the DOF from a certain premises. Um, that obviously all would go to DSO having to protect the public purse on such occasions um, and not pay out ex exorbitant sums. Um, Moving on from this, uh, a couple of things I would like to highlight to you. 
in relation to um, DSO and the, the working group um, that generally it's the policy of government that repairs um, are dealt with at least termination, not before then, um, which again impacts why there's, everything's pushed towards the end. Mm -hmm. And they also um, pointed out within their correspondence with me um, that there's a lack of consistency across the departments and the arm's length bodies that they are looking at in terms of the management of dilapidations claims and that they are to be devising a process to deal with these claims um, that should be able to better coordinate for more consistency across the departments. Um, and they speak of particular claims that aren't in the list because it concerns Department for Communities um, and uh, another property by DOF. Uh, I think it's Oyster House. Um, so they're looking to make sure that if it moves to legal advice, that they're consistency, consistently looking to see um, if there's evidence for a lack of intention on the part of the landlord to carry out work subsequent to the departure, the, the, uh, the tenant's departure from the property. Um, and again, it's to protect the public purse. And just, to, ju mm -hmm. ju just so I've got this in my mind, get this correct. The issue of the dilapidation cost, in some respects, has already been agreed because at the end of the lease, you have a surveyor that both people agree to. That is the figure that the surveyor has on what the dilapidation cost is. It, it could, th that could, that's a scenario that it could happen, yes. Yeah. So what they're then arguing about is even though they've agreed what the independent surveyor has said, then they're into the pr process of saying uh, how much because I noticed here there's a, there's a quite a clear bit that you put in there. I said, and it was an interesting bit that you put in about sort of the last point. We say that before they do anything, they discuss it with their budget manager and the senior staff officer of the EMU. So mm -hmm. regardless of what the surveyor said and regardless of what the process was, there's budget implications have to be discussed first before any claim is settled. I would imagine that's a part of the legal advice and due diligence. Right. Okay. Here, here. Sorry, sorry for mm -hmm. that. No worries. Um, so consistency um, is an issue. So um, as we move through this, it, it may be in the committee's interest to ask DOF and the DSO um, to learn a little bit more about the, the working group mm -hmm. and its, its future um, work program in terms of developing and agreeing a coordinated dilapidation process to ensure the consistency, but that's looking forward. Um, so against that backdrop, I now move to the, the data, um, and there's three tables provided through pages 11 to 15, um, and then there's just a further um, paragraph that tries to explain about a case that's currently in negotiation. So in Table A, which is basically um, the bulk of the properties, there's 11 of them during this particular period, I've outlined for you the date the claim came in, the date the dilapidations agreement, um, sorry, the dilapidations amounts were agreed by the surveyors, and then the date of the deed release and payment, which means that there's been legal checks and due diligence um, that is enabling um, the departments to settle. Um, to close off the claim. And I guess what you can observe from those tables is that um, the number of months from the claim made to payment, and it, they range from five to 21 months, which is an average of about nearly 13 months. Of, um, so um, it, it at least gives you some idea of the time um, in which these claims usually run, given this group of properties that we've looked at. Um, and again, it's just very important to have clear in the mind that agreed dilapidations amounts, that's where the surveyors agree it, and they have to be subject to the legal checks and due diligence. Um, so we can, you know, it's a protracted process, um, and those two steps probably are a part of the explanation. Um, moving to table B on page 14, there is a property um, where it's nearly to be settled. Um, 
there has been an agreement between the surveyors. It has gone through the, the legal advice and diligence checks, and there's draft deeds of release um, that have been um, going, that they have gone back and forth between the, um, the DSODF, DOF, and the landlord. But I think there was a mix up on the landlord's solicitor's address, so that has slowed down the process. But it looks like that that will soon complete. And I just draw your attention to the fact that the date the claim was received was May 2018, um, and the agreed amount was in September 2018. So that's what four months, hmm. and now it looks like we're soon moving towards um, settlement. So that one maybe took longer, will have in time have taken longer than the average, and longer than the 21 month that was the longest in the first grouping that I discussed with you. So moving on to Table C, um, there's two properties that are in dispute, um, and the uh, legal advice, I, I imagine, has advised to continue to be in dispute. No legal proceedings have been launched yet by the landlord, and obviously it's down to the landlord to progress this yeah. further. Um, in Royston House, the reason for the um, dispute from DOF's perspective is that the um, landlord suffered loss of X amount, and they dispute that amount. Waterford Plaza, there's um, a dispute in relation to the accuracy of the contents of the schedule and the quantum. Uh, again similar to what I said before, the committee may want to engage with DOF in relation to those two to learn more, to clarify maybe the nature of the dispute, for example, whether there's unusual or ambiguous lease provisions. Um, a further claim in negotiation concerns a property um, in the Lisburn area, um, and it looks like that there's some clarification being sought by DOF from DSO. Um, and then DSO, in turn, has gone to the department's surveyor to understand more what the interpretation of the reinstatement obligations are. So again, we're right back to those clause provisions, and is there ambiguity in them? Again, the committee may wish to engage further in that regard. So I guess um, if I was to make some concluding remarks, um, it's an area of law that's complex, and it can be fraught with difficulty. It takes time to resolve. Um, the law has been found to be limited in the jurisdiction, um, as recognized um, by uh, a number of um, the RICS actually has pointed that out at um, seminars it has provided through its training materials. The civil courts are encouraging mediation if the parties don't move to it themselves. Um, and during the period, as I said, they would generally resolve within five to 21 months, the 11 properties we had looked at, um, that did resolve. Um, another is soon to be paid, and two others are in dispute, um, and one further is in negotiation. It seems that um, DOF, along with the DSO, working with the Lease Management Working Group, which includes um, the Strategic Investment Board, the AMU, the Assets Management Unit, they're taking some measures in looking at the handling of the claims um, and agreeing a way forward. But this committee may be you know, interested in keeping a watching brief in that area um, for reasons that you're scrutinizing. Liam, what stage is that at, at the moment? Um, it, they're still, they, there's, they're developing it and agreeing it. So I, I think there's some kind of a draft, but that would need to be confirmed in relation to a dilapidations process. And I imagine it would have to be agreed through appropriate channels, whether that is beyond the working group. So it may be helpful to receive maybe the, um, the forward working program of yeah. that, that group, um, and maybe even to be learning more about the nature or the incidents where there's unusual or ambiguous clause provisions relating to um, those two covenants. Have we any idea what it's like in the private sector? Because obviously in Northern Ireland everything is skewed by the size of the public sector. 
And one of the issues with most landlords is I think they would be quite hesitant to take on the sort of the biggest sort of um, the market, which is of course the public sector looking for sort of prime retail or prime rental space and accommodation space as well. Have we got any idea if what what happens in the private sector? Is it is it faster or are there equally or is that information uh, kept quite close hold? What I, what I can glean is from RICS, their training programs and their modules, and they're attended by people from the public as well as from the private sector. And these presentations, um, the points that I pointed out about the law, the private sector is grappling with as well. Right. But I have not conducted any kind of a study to examine the private sector, and there would be the problems in lo um, securing the data in yeah. order to do that. Okay. And it just seems to be that again. This is a question. So the uh, question seems to be in the timeline. The surveyor seems to be critical in this and the discussions, but there is probably a limited number of surveyors within Northern Ireland can do this role. Do we have any information on how many surveyors are actually accredited to be able to do this level of work in Northern Ireland? I get. I'm not. I'm not sure because I haven't looked into that. Um, but I can see that there'll probably be movement from English surveyors coming over because we're following the RICS guidance in yeah. itself. Um, it may be beneficial for the committee to write to RICS to learn more about that in that regard, as well as to maybe. Um, to defer to some of the legal experts that have come in and provided training, and some of those people are from within this jurisdiction, so it would be easy enough for them to come in and advise the committee in um, speaking from a more informed and experienced perspective. Jim, can you make a note of that about RICS? So we might, uh, I'll, I'll put it to the committee after Alan's given her evidence and the rest of it. Um, so Paul. Yeah, Chair, and I would support the, the uh, call to get RICS up just to have a chat with them about this. This intrigues me. It really does. Yeah. Uh, two things st stands out. Uh, one understandable and one not so understandable in my eyes. The first one is time. We all know that government cogs turn slowly. <laughs> you inject a legal process or advice into that and the cogs will jam up even further. So you can understand how we're talking about months but that's all right for government. But in the private sector, time is of the essence. Time is money, effectively. So I, 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 you would think that efficiently and effectively, these things should be sorted out much more quicker. Once you then seek legal advice and everything else, that's how it would slow down. And I get, I get the protection of the public pound, and I get the setting of precedents uh, that will have to be carefully uh, Future proofed. I get that. Uh, but I think the most striking thing for me, and my second point, is the differential between uh, figures, between the landlord and the tenant, or the lesser and the lessee, I think they're called, with regards to lease. Some of these settlement amounts, and that's of course where there's agreement. Some of them, in fact, two of them, is only 13% of the actual amount claimed in the first place. Like, that strikes me as bizarre. How someone, as a landlord, could either be really overrated, or government could go so low as to offer a 13% of that claim and get that accepted. So, I suppose what I want to try and delve down into, like this, a lot of this, this is not like a paint. Um, so is it fundamental structures in a property? Or is it, or is it, I'll ask the question, is it as simple as you should have left the building as you found it, you haven't decorated it in the four years you've been here, you really need to do something here before you leave this place so that we can then offer it out to the next tenant? And again, uh, I, get, I get a government Department, no, no business should be giving out loads of money for the building then to, to be demolished the next year or for a new tenant to come straight in. So I get that safeguards and why you would want to safeguard that, the public pound on that. But it's the differentials of money, 13% agreed. Mm. 
That's, that's, that's striking to me. It's weird. So just, Elaine, would it be safe to say, and this is where I'm sort of coming back around to the piece about the surveyor, because that the process that the surveyor becomes involved when there is basically a notice to quit that comes to it, and the surveyor gets involved at the end of it to be able to come to a cost that it is to get that. So that is the cost that both sides are negotiating about. But when they've come to that, and then there's a, such a massive differential between what is actually the surveyor says and what is actually paid, because I, I notice sort of the length of time it takes to be agreed, but it's the question of what is being agreed. Because I imagine some people would think that you know this has been going on long enough; it's costing quite a lot. I'm going to settle for a much lower figure just to get the just to get it across the line. Um, and again, that's maybe something we should be taking uh, taking a view on. But you reckon that the RICS would be a good people to sort of touch base um, with and to talk about that? Um, with the legal, with the legal, led, you know, uh, people who are legal experts. But if I may come back Certainly. to just yeah, a couple of points in relation to damages, you're talking about the alleged damages. You're talking about the total amount of the items specified in the schedule, and yes. there can be dispute about that. But you're also talking about the fees, the legal, the surveyor, and the consequential losses. So it's to make the landlord whole, obviously, mm -hmm. for having had to bring these, um, um, this claim forward. So their like, consequential losses could include rent, rates, insurance, etc. Mm -hmm. So you start, it, it starts to mount, you know, especially if the time is more pertinent. So, so uh, those subsequential losses, how would that? occur so would that be a case where you've signed the lease as a government department you've signed the lease for 10 years and you've realized that you only need it for six years so there's a four-year void there is that what that means no i i um if i may sure. a, again legal um advice would help you in this regard but just from what my reading is in relation to the materials i've looked at and again relying on rics quite heavily their materials um the those those you could have lost rent because the tenant has left, but they right, haven't okay. been able to rent it again. And then the rates that they have to pay, because the rates would be built into the next rental agreement. So it's just it's a cumulative. Yeah, um, I got you know. And then quite, just coming back to the total amount yeah. in the schedule, there will be a dispute over certain things being included in the schedule. Yeah. But I think if you're getting legal advice, you can talk about the damages issue. But in addition to that, it merits maybe talking about those provisions and leases, and why there maybe isn't. I, I, maybe there is. I don't know. But maybe they should be scrutinising lease terms more closely before, before signing them. the lease in the first place. And the second thing is is about the government policy about repair at the end, not during. Okay. That's another point, and that's maybe better directed at the see, DOF. I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but in my head, I can see a scenario where a tenant, or, sorry, a landlord, and again, some of these people are, can be quite wealthy, I'm sure, but and our organisations could be quite wealthy, but. And, and have a lot of capacity, but you can understand where you can understand where both parties don't want to go to court. So you're nearly at all costs don't go to court. So so you're sitting there and you're balancing up the cost of court mm -hmm. with what the money you could well receive. And then I think you could get a position where if if the government department plays hard nose and I'm talking about all departments here, not just finance of course, the government department plays hard nose enough the 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 landlord will come to a realization will look this is as good as it's going to get for me here and i'm just going to have to take the settled amount uh, and, and that would be a lot of pressure time pressure but also the cost of court pressure added to that and they just settle for something now there, there's a protection of a public pound but then there's also screwing business into the ground and, and so government really needs to find that balance. And I just, I can't see the balance with these figures. And that really worries me. Worries me. And I do think the department needs to, or the committee needs to investigate further. And I think RICS is, the, is a good place to start along maybe with legal profession. And again, and just before I bring Pratt in, and thanks for that, Paul, but one of the issues we have seen recently is discussion about in NAMA, one of the real difficulties was the difference in the valuations and bearing in mind the difference in the valuation that the surveyors had put on some properties and then they were sold at considerably lesser value. 
So there's another example here of the valuations being skewed as part of as part of the part of the process. So maybe us getting a more detailed understanding of the process through the RICS and through the uh, we will we'll think about who we get from some legal advice from just to come and explain to the committee about that because there is a very marked difference between what the claim is, what is eventually paid and what is eventually settled. And there seems to be and I, I could be completely wrong, but there seems to be a degree of a pattern to this which might be seen as being in some respects I hate using the words anti competitive, but it does sound as if it's sort of might be skewing the market. And, and let me just stress, out of out of the nine properties that we'd looked at on uh, I think it was a government paper. Uh, I can't remember what date it was that sent us with nine properties on it that had all been agreed and paid. Only one of them got the 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 amount claimed. It was paid out 100 percent. Only one. Now it's very little money compared to some of the other ones. But then you ask the, you ask yourself the question: How come that was paid in full? Uh, and that's the only one. And again, that was resolved in four months. Whereas some of them sit there for 18 months, 15 months. So again, there's a discrepancy there on the other side uh, that, that you have to ask questions on. Okay. But, ah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just in relation to that, sorry, and that, that, that last point, though, it's important to realise there's no statutory cap within the jurisdiction no. on damages, and that will be impacting um, in some way, shape, or form. And then under the common law, there is it's untested. So. That's another factor yeah. combined with what were the lease terms to begin with, yeah. and are they unusual, or are they maybe imprecise, creating ambiguity, and then we get back to the issue of surveyors. Or is there an inflation point going on to begin with? So there's there's a myriad of issues, and most importantly, it's hard to look across all of them when you don't and make any kind of a deduction because you don't know the facts yeah. of the individual cases, and the cases rise and fall on the merits of the case. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, we don't know the facts, but there's huge differences in the amounts. And uh, to what you said, yes, for the uh, Royal Society of Chartered Surveyors, for them to come in and for that difference to be so great, even just looking at that one which is in the sightings in Lisburn, I mean, it's £105,000. It go a long way towards the arts. It's crying mm. out for money at the moment. But to bring in the law, uh, m my question uh, really to you was, if, if in order to try to get settlement out of that, bringing in the law doesn't help that whatsoever, because mm. none of these has been settled. Has there through law or the intervention of law? 21 months is your long one. Is there no way that you can think of that that can be shortened or that that time can be done out? Um, um, look, um, what, uh, on the 12th of the 11th, the sightings was handed back to the landlord. On the 18th of the 9th, there was a fee put in for 266. Uh, following the negotiations by the department, there's a re-settlement uh, value of 161, but it's still not settled. That's over a year now. Well, mm -hmm. isn't it that over a year? It's, the point I'm trying to make there's something seriously wrong with the figures from professional bodies, and do you know? I think the question needs to be asked. I mean, if someone else was having a difference of a hundred thousand pound, not knowing all the facts, but I'm going to call it out sometime. To, to me, it looks criminal. It the. the the process of going through to try and to resolve the disputes, they are going to contemplate, that is going to contemplate the law within mm -hmm. the jurisdiction because, so any precedents that, you know, all like English that in relation to damages say, they're going to look at them, yeah. but they're untested here yeah. in the courts. And so, because the civil courts are trying to push things to right. mediation, there's even, you know, you don't have test cases being heard. Is there a question over the length of time it takes to resolve these, or whether or not there can be improvements made to the law to shorten the time? I mean, do you think that there are improvements within the law that probably could shorten the time? Or once it goes to law, it's going to it's well, allowed to it's spring? Long it does, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, yeah. uh, just thank you, uh, Fauci Road. You're very welcome uh, this evening as well. Um, 
and was released again to this sort of time period. Uh, one of the ones that not resolved their rice in the House, the 4th or the 5th, 2017. And uh, I know that you did allude to the fact that they themselves hadn't pursued it and that uh, the department's actually waiting on them, is it? Yeah, um, the indies, um, the claims can only be asserted by the landlords. So if you don't have a settlement, you know, through your surveyors, and then it goes on to the um, to the next level, so to speak, then it can continue through some kind of an ongoing negotiation of a sorts, um, or it can then go through legal proceedings where a landlord will allege um, a sort of claim. And then maybe in that scenario, um, they may be directed to go through an alternative dispute resolution and to mediate, or they may go the full way. And just in this case as well, too, it's already over the three-year period, and uh, you don't seem to be any closer to a resolution or even for any other development to take place. Uh, because I'm assuming that uh, whenever uh, these types of claims that are made, that um, uh, the budget has to actually set aside again to fund, so it's actually tying up entirely within uh, government uh, funding in order to meet these claims. And what they have to do is probably tie it up at the level at which it has been claimed, rather than maybe I, mm. at their level. So I do think it's an expense that's even um, on government too, and that's. Um, it should be a priority with them to ensure that uh, they do instigate a settlement of some shape or form, uh, while it does even bring it on to uh, the courts itself. Mm, Chair, if I may, um, it, that is something that the committee may wish to ask the department more questions of. Um, it, there can be a whole host. You'll have a richer evidence base to to go yeah. from, but some of this stuff um, they probably won't disclose either because some of it is going to be yeah. privilege. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we talk about. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Again, thank you very much indeed for a very well researched uh, paper. Uh, the only issue is it's probably now raised more questions with us than we uh, we had answers to. But thank you very much indeed. And again. First rate work. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Okay. okay a team from the committee's perspective, I think there was a couple of actions that have come out of that. One is probably to take this further and have some discussions with the um, maybe have the RICS to come and give us um, give some oral evidence on uh, dilapidations and the process and how else it works, because they'll have more information about what happens in the private sector, but also what happens across this rest of this country as well. Can I, can I ask Sir, another yeah, thing? Too? And I should have asked it, and I, I didn't want to prolong the meeting, uh, so I let it go. But even the mediation concept, when, when the judge says, look, for goodness sake, go and sort this out among yourselves, surely a mediation at that point is really, right, here's a figure here, and here's a figure here. Where can we meet in the middle? Mm -hmm. and that in itself, if that's, med if that's what they mean by mediation in this scenario, that's not really a, a, a settled position to be at either. It's not really sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, uh, look, through the... Uh, I just want to say, look, I, I thought we were going to get some more. When we, she's raised some really good questions for us, I think we need to get some answers to. But I feel before we engage with the department, we should be talking to the RICS to get ourselves a, a wider perspective on it. And if we're content to do that, let's see if we can schedule some uh, evidence from the RICS. And uh, Leanne also mentioned something about getting some uh, legal opinion. Um, particularly on this area of uh, sort of dilapidation and surveying, I don't quite know how we do that, but we'll take that for action outside the committee to have a look at the possibility of that. Chair, sure, I, I can I can review what what was you referring to, and in the meantime, uh, get in touch with RACS, and then possibly at that stage, when yeah. the committee yeah. has more information, then consider whether legal yeah. advice. But I, I think we're agreed we want to take this further. Yeah. So, think... so what do we actually mean by legal advice? Because obviously we don't want a committee's legal. We don't want advice on something, but we, I think what we need is the experiences of legal services in this field. That's probably what we want, and it may well be some of the some of the companies and landlords who have wrote, written to the committee might be able to yeah, help so. in that. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll do that outside the. Yeah. Do that. Sorry, uh, Pat, and just okay. to add, what's the protection? Uh, 
to the tenant, and the one in Lisburn especially, which happens to be yeah, the department itself. Okay. Uh, if we're content, uh, can we now move on to the next item on the agenda, and item number seven, which is the SR 20 20 2009, the business tenancies, coronavirus restrictions on forfeiture, relevant period, Northern Ireland Amendment number two, Regulation 2020. And draw your attention to the briefing note on page 69, uh, the SR itself on page 70. I would like to inform members that section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 provides that a right of re entry or forfeiture under a relevant business tenancy for non-payment of rent may not be enforced. The relevant period is defined as in the period started from Royal Assent and ending with the 30th of September 2020. The new draft will extend the relevant peri- period of Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act to the 31st of December 2020. I say the regulations are subject to the negative revolution procedure before the Assembly. Uh, the Committee considered the SL1 in its meeting on the 30th of September and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content, content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has not reported on SR 20 2009, and if the Committee is content with the Statutory Rule, it would be agreed subject to the ESR's report. Do I have your agreement? Agreed. Therefore, as the members have agreed that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2020-209, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restrictions on Forfeiture Relative Period, Northern Ireland Amendment No. 2, Regulations 2020, and subject to the SR report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. I would like to move on to number, uh, item number 8 on the agenda, the written evidence, main estimates and budget number 3 bill. I would like to draw the members' attention to the table related to the main estimates and budget number 3 bill has been tabled at page 2. Uh, before I ask for any comments, um, I have obviously it is a considerable volume of work, and is going to take quite a lot of time to uh, look at. I have scanned it. I cannot say that I can actually speak with any degree of confidence at this present moment in time. I haven't had the chance to really significantly look at it, um, and, but I'm willing to take any comments from other members if we wish to just consider it and then take it in oral evidence next week, having had a week to uh, look at it in detail. Any thoughts? Agreed. Oh, well, Paul? Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Oh. Matthew? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to item number nine, Northern Ireland Statistics and Research's annual report. Right, Chair, you're saying item number nine, number eight? Sorry, Chair, there is a table in the chair for it. All right. There, so it's always one number back. Yeah. Oh, it's one number now. Right, I'll leave the number out in that case, and then I will say NISRA, <laughs> annual report and accounts. Yeah. Clark's I just briefing. say that's scrutiny at its best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Proves you're reading the thing. Uh, Clark's briefing is annual report and accounts is page 77. Certified annual report on accounts is page 79. Members, do we have any comments? That is the case of your content to ask NISRA to provide a written response to the question highlighted in the Clark's paper. I would be content to do that. Yep. Thank you. We move on to the next item of the agenda, the Department of Finance Public Income and Expenditure Account for the year ended 31st of March 2020. On page 168 is an account of the public income and expenditure expenditure for Northern Ireland. It is at in the year ended 31st of March 2020, together with the balance of the consolidated fund on the 1st of April 2019. The receipts and payments not being public income and expenditure in the year ended 31st of March, and the balance in the consolidated fund on that day. Members, do we have any comments? Are we content to note? Okay. Uh, so, as we move on to item number 11, now uh, chairperson's business. Uh, with the committee's uh, with the committee's uh, consent, I would like to write to Sean and thank him for his valuable contribution and ask him how he managed to get an escape tunnel so quick uh, to do that as well. And if you're content, I would, I would like to write to him and thank him for his contribution to the, the committee so far. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, I'd like to inform members that page 200 is a letter from the minister giving notice of his intent to make a statement on upcoming spending review and fiscal flexibilities and an offer to meet with myself and the deputy chairperson before the statement. I would like to say to the committee that uh, on these issues, the finance minister has been very open and um, has, has made every effort to communicate with the committee, with the chair, 
He offered the briefing as well from the Deputy Chair. I know, Paul, you were unable to make it. But and the dialogue and communications between the Minister, not necessarily saying the Department, but the Minister and myself has been pretty good recently. And that's something I would like to continue and encourage. And again, through the committee, uh, verbally, we'll, I'll pass on to him the fact that we're uh, content with the, sort of the process that we're making so far. Um, the ministerial statement, which is page 429, which you heard. And uh, I'd like to inform the members that the committee has received an emergency SL1, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, which will form the next agenda item. Uh, I'd like to do, inform you that I had a discussion with the uh, Finance Minister. I was also involved in conversations, uh, obviously, with members of the Executive over the last um, uh, uh, period of time, particularly about the issues to do with the North West and the necessity and the speed with which we needed to get some form of um, uh, support to uh, companies and businesses in that area. I agreed with the Finance Minister that the easiest way to do it was through um, uh, the resolution pushed through by the Finance Minister. Uh, I will put on the record, I will also say to the Finance Minister that I was disappointed that the Economy Minister had not grasped the opportunity to do that. And I notice there seems to be a pattern here that is developing of, if we are not doing it through the Economy Department, it is either the Department of Infrastructure or the Department of Communities, and now the Department of Finance seems to be picking up the slack. Um, we had a meeting, we obviously had a debate yesterday in the Assembly when we talked about support for small and medium enterprises. And uh, I th will probably raise independently uh, with your consent, I will have a discussion with the Chair of the Econ Economy Committee about how we should be, uh, if the economy committee is having, if the economy department is having difficulty delivering these things, how we as committees can be assisting them to uh, expedite the process. And if not, we need to make sure that we're getting support out to companies as required. Uh, do we have any comments, team? Alyssa? I would just like to comment and uh, compliment uh, the, uh, uh, the minister uh, for his swift and decisive action uh, in relation to the North West in particular. Uh, and I know too that uh, he has already uh, alluded to the fact that, in, in relation to other areas, that in, uh, in, the, in, in the future, that in the event of them finding themselves in similar situations, that it will be rolled out entirely for them as well. Okay. Ian, are you going to brief us on that? Yes, Chair. Oh, welcome. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you for taking this item on the agenda at such extremely short notice. Um, as the committee members will be aware, um, on Thursday of last week, the First and Deputy First Minister announced that um, additional restrictions have been introduced in the Derry City and Stravanger Council area. Um, those restrictions took effect from this Monday. Um, the First and Deputy First Minister also announced last Thursday that there would be a package of financial support made available for businesses in the North West affected by those restrictions. Um, the, uh, the Department of Finance uh, proposes to bring forward a statutory rule to give effect to that support package scheme. Um, the, um, the reason why we are doing it in this way is that there is no obvious legislative vehicle at the minute which gives us the legislative cover to make the payments, so one has to be brought forward. And We are using Section 1 um, of the uh, Financial Assistance Act of 2009 to do that, um, so we are making regulations under that section. Um, this is still very much um, a draft in process. Um, I've just come from a, a, a video conference with the Department of Solicitor's Office where we were talking through some of the details of it. So some of the details in this paper are subject to change before the final um, regulations are made. Um, the intent is then to make um, available a package of financial support. Um, two levels are proposed as outlined in the um, SL1 letter. Um, a basic payment of £800 for each two-week period um, for businesses and properties with a net annual value of £15,000 or less, and a higher payment of £1,200 for each two-week period um, for businesses and properties with net annual values of £15,000 and one or above. Um, the level of funding is um, brought in line though slightly above what is available in um, England um, for lockdowns that is calculated over a three-week period, £1,500 for each three-week period. Um, and the um, support that's available in um, the Republic of Ireland um, for areas and similar restrictions is a little different. At the bottom end, um, it is lower than our £800 payment, um, but it does go up to much higher levels for very large businesses. Um, the 
draft rule will set out the eligibility criteria for the scheme. As I said, these are still a work in um, progress, so they may change slightly from what's proposed here. But obviously, the businesses will only be eligible <laughs> if they operate from an address in the Derry City and Surround District Council area. Um, the uh, eligible businesses will be those who are directly affected by the provisions of Schedule 3 of the restrictions which were introduced um, in this past week, the coronavirus regulations introduced by the Department of Health. Uh, so, in addition to cafes, hotels, guest houses, um, pubs, and restaurants, um, cinemas and bowling alleys are also the kinds of businesses which are restricted under those regulations, and we'll have to add those in. Um, obviously, it will be a requirement um, that the business was in fact trading on the 1st of October when the restrictions were announced. Um, and also that um, the business concerned must not fail to comply with any COVID-19 prohibition that was issued by the police in the, in the previous um, period of time. Um, there are some slight differences from the grant schemes which the members may be familiar with previously. Um, a business does not have to pay business rates to be eligible for this scheme, um, whereas it did have to for the £10,000-£25,000 grant. Um, so, therefore, um, a cafe, for example, which is operating from within a larger premises um, would be eligible because they would be obliged to close, whereas, for example, if it was inside a shop, the shop would be allowed to stay open. Um, also, um, uh, any cafe or restaurant or similar kind of service delivered by a social enterprise or charity, uh, which would have been, um, therefore, exempt from rates, um, wouldn't have been able to qualify for one of the previous grants, but will be able to qualify for this. Okay, um, we estimate um, around about 400 businesses will qualify for this support in the, in the council area. Um, we are going to uh, put in place an online application process, which I hope will be um, available for use from Monday at the very latest, if not before that point. Um, I'm try in an effort to if get we can get this through, can we get it done quicker? Um, the, the payments can only be released whenever the, uh, the regulations are laid and made. So um, we, um, we could get the application process started before the regulations are made, but we couldn't actually then move to the next step and get the money to the businesses until they are. Okay. Um, the, um, the, so the financial implications of this are um, if the restrictions last for a two-week period, as initially intended, um, and they are restricted to this one council area, um, we expect the cost will be in the region of about £300,000. Obviously, it is possible that the restrictions may have to be extended to other council areas or be extended for a longer period of time in this council area, in which case the cost will go up. And are we going to draft the legislation so that it can be used not just for this council area? Yes, it will be um, able to be extended to other areas. as our, um, So it will be connected to the health regulations which are brought in to give effect to these restrictions, yep. and then we will follow on from that. Um, um, and I think that's as much as I have to say on the detail of it at this point. I'm happy to answer any questions the members might have. And sort of the one bit about time limits of it: Are we is there flex in the time limits, or is it going to be limited to the three-week period, two uh, to three-week period, or is it going to be tied to the health regulations? Uh, it'll be tied to the health regulations. So if they are extended, um, then uh, for another two weeks, um, then there'll be another payment cover the additional two weeks will be made. And okay. So the payment refer is a two week payment and then if it gets extended it gets yes, it, it's done. That's that the the intention. Small, small. Yep, no, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much and I welcome that help as well that's <coughs> come through. I'm just thinking of some small there there aren't many. Uh, I'm thinking of a pub in mm. particular that probably are, that did not open, that uh, made that decision to stay mm. close. Uh, that is not going to be rolled out to them. Simply, they stay closed in order to try and uh, protect their staff. Mm -hmm. This won't be rolled out to them. They didn't open on the 1st of October. They've stayed closed from the lockdown come in. Yeah. It can't be brought into them now. Um, I'm not aware of any individual business which might be in that situation, but it's something we'll have to take I do know order. some. I okay. do know some. Yeah. And, and, could furnish you one or two in that area at the moment. I'm just thinking that they did, I, I believe they did the right thing. They tried to protect their customers. Mm -hmm. They stayed closed. And for doing that, that would still be a help to them. And, and not to give it to them because they are a small number, <coughs> I think, would be a, a penalty mm -hmm. that they're not deserving of. So well, we'll you will look at, that. look at that. Thank yes. you. Okay. Philip? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, mean, I, I welcome the fact that there are changes in terms of the previous business support grants, particularly for social enterprises and businesses that uh, uh, are tenants and aren't paying the rates. So, I mean, I think that's welcome. Also, obviously, welcome the swiftness uh, and the turn turnaround of this. Uh, 
I was going to ask the number of businesses that you think that it will have a positive impact on or, or that will benefit from this, and also if the application process opens on Monday, how swiftly will there be a turnaround in payment? I mean, when will businesses actually see uh, money going into their accounts? Yeah, the, the estimate of the number of businesses is taken from information we've got from the Council's Environmental Health Department um, mm -hmm. about businesses in those kind of categories, so roughly 400. Um, we may have to add on a few for things like cinemas and so forth because the estimate doesn't include those. Um, but the number of businesses in those kind of categories wouldn't be very large, I don't, don't expect. Um, in terms of the speed of the payments, um, we certainly want to get the payments out before the end of the first two week period. Um, we don't want people to be waiting long times after that. Um, we are attempting to set the process up so that if um, the application comes in and all the information is in order and can be validated automatically, it will follow through to a payment automatically as soon as the regulations are made. Um, if there has to be some issue checked, then a member of staff will look at it. We have a team based in the North West, so we have people on the ground who would know the area and should be able to make decisions quite rapidly. And just one follow-up point. I mean, yes, sir. Obviously, it would be useful, the application process being as simple and straightforward as possible. Paul? Yeah, first of all, can I just say thank you, Ian, because uh, I think this is the first time you've been in front of this committee since the, the crisis really took hold and the rollout of the first business support scheme. Can I just say that your responsiveness, I know you put in mighty shifts at that time, but your responsiveness between you personally and your team was second to none. And I just thank want you. to thank you for, for that support that you gave all the MLAs uh, that would have been inquiring of on behalf of businesses. You'll know one of the issues that I would have brought to you was the guest houses that, were under, that weren't operating under business rates. And there's obviously <laughs> advantages for not. Uh, operating on our business rates, but am I right in saying that you said that guest houses that are operating on ordinary rates, domestic rates, will be able to qualify for this additional support now? Um, no, you, you don't have to be paying business rates or liable to pay business rates to qualify for this. So um, potentially a business in one of the qualifying sectors, if it's registered with the Environmental Health Department, um, for example, the guest house that was um, rated domestically could potentially qualify if it's registered with environmental health in that way. And do you know and understand the process of registra registration under the Environmental Health Department? Is there any unknown concerns in that registration process that could snag um, businesses going it's, forward? Um, the the list um, obviously has been affected by the, um, the coronavirus restrictions as well and the council's ability to operate. <coughs> now, the, the council advises me that they are satisfied their list is 97 to 99% accurate. Um, they don't deny there's a possibility that some businesses may have changed hands um, or gone out of business in between time, or there may be some new businesses which are in the process of registering. So um, we're, we're aware of that. That's why we're allowing for the um, additional um, you know, investigation of each individual claim. Okay, thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Gemma? Thank you, and thanks, Ian. And I want to echo Paul's words as well. Actually, you were very helpful during the, the pandemic. Um, just one question, and let's be premature, seeing as it hasn't opened yet, but is, will there be a deadline for the applications, or will it just be rolled in for the two weeks? Um, well, I would assume anybody who's affected by the restrictions are going to apply fairly yeah, rapidly. So, um, um, but the scheme will be running for as long as the, or the restrictions are in place in Derry and So um, um, obviously the, we, will, we will try to be as helpful as possible as we can with the business, but we would like to get it sorted out as quickly as possible because if within the first two-week period we can get all businesses dealt with and paid, then if the restrictions are extended, it's an automatic process to make the next payment. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Jim? Is there a copy of the determination by the First and Deputy First Minister under the legislation? Um, I haven't had the chance to look and see it, but I saw um, an, um, a letter earlier today from them said they were content that this be processed through the urgent procedure, but that was before um, the Minister's announcement was made, so I'll have to go back and check and see whether that's been received yet. You accept that under the 2011 Act there has to be a determination? Oh, yes, yes, please. Um, why is it the Department of Finance that has been uh, appointed to administer this? Um, as our minister um, approached the First and Deputy First Minister and the rest of the executive and proposed that we would take this responsibility on. Has the Department of Finance ever uh, organised and run a grant aid scheme? 
Apart from the previous COVID-19 grants, we haven't been involved in administering any. Yes. It could have been a department that might be thought to have more experience of running grant schemes like economy. Um, yes, a number of options were, were looked at. Um, it's, it's been given to a department that doesn't have the infrastructure, doesn't have the personnel with the experience of running a grant scheme, probably has never had to draft up an application form for a grant scheme. Um, though I would say, Mr Alistair, that we did have extensive experience of doing the previous grant scheme, um, which we, we picked up at quite short notice, and we have applied all that we have learned from delivering that into how we have designed and set this process up. The small business one? Yes. In which many businesses, well, a number of businesses, uh, were paid money, and now you are looking the money back? Um, one percent, we estimate, yes. of of errors or payments may have, may have been made in there. Yeah. What protections are there against fraud in the scheme? Um, in terms of the design of the scheme, we have um, um, we we've put in a number of protections around this, so that a a business which um, is insolvent or is in the process of being made insolvent or has uh, been dormant. Um, there will be checks to make sure that businesses aren't in that kind of category. Um, we are asking people to declare whether or not they received one of the other grants previously, the 10000 25000 or the hardship fund payment. Um, if they say that they have, and we will say, do you want to use the same bank account? And If they say yes, then that is an indication that it, we know that person from beforehand and are able to, to deal with that. We will take out all the cases where we believe there has been a payment made in error under any one of those previous grant schemes, so that will prevent um, a recipient of a grant paid in error previously also receiving this if they have been paid in error. If the person then declares that they would like to use a different bank account, we will set that one aside for further checking and will contact the person we know to be the owner of the business involved to make sure that they are content that a different bank account be used. Um, we are cross-referencing the applications, names and addresses um, against both the environmental health list and our own rating database, and if those things tie up, it will be a reasonable assurance that the uh, business is legitimate. Thank you. Jim. Uh, would you like a night to do an MBE? That would be lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, because I have to say, one of the most refreshing aspects, and perhaps the only encouraging aspect of the coronavirus, has been the efficiency of your department in, the, in administering the, the grants. And you were put under huge pressure. You had a very helpful gentleman based in Donock Moral, not in name and spare his embarrassment, but um, he was incredibly helpful, and every one of the cases I dealt with was resolved effectively. And you can't often say that about any government department, but particularly under the stress that you're at. So, therefore, I welcome the fact that you have been carried on, you're carrying on the, uh, the new procedure, particularly in the North West, because you've shown yourselves capable of dealing with it. So, I would differ from Jim on that. I think you're the, the obvious body to look after that. So, I have absolutely no complaints whatsoever. Simply, this is the first opportunity I've had that you've been back before us uh, since that happened. And I'm delighted to say that all the files I have in my office on this issue are closed. So I wish my colleagues in London, Derry, and Strabane best wishes because I think they're going to find an equally very effective service. And all I can say is keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Matthew. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, uh, again for coming to so quickly and, all, and you're genuinely for your um, hard work over the last six, uh, six, seven months on this, and uh, no doubt more hard work to come. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, the eight hundred pounds or twelve hundred pounds a fortnight, depending on NAV, were those numbers arrived at for any particular reason other than affordability? Um, the, well, the ministers considered a number of different payment levels, um, some of which were lower than that. Um, so we did look at the levels of assistance that were available in Donegal and in England, yeah. um, and the levels which have been set out here are marginally above that. Um, so I think the ministers determined that they felt, um, although any single figure is going to be arbitrary because it can't be connected into the precise amount of a loss or um, compensation required for any kind of business whenever you're looking at this sort of a scheme, it did seem to be, uh, broadly speaking, um, what would be necessary to compensate the businesses required to close or severely curtail their operations for the loss that they would endure. 
and, and the loss meaning not the entire, not the loss of income, yeah. because you couldn't subsidise that. Yeah. It, it, it's um, what there is it, is it is it I mean is the thinking that that this amount that if it's uh, four hundred quid a week for a just for the sake of argument a small family sole operated family owned pub mm -hmm. in you know Castle Dirt for the sake of argument mm -hmm. um, that would be. That's not. That's covering effectively their utilities and some of their fixed costs. Not. Yes. Not their staff. It wouldn't not, be sufficient not, probably to cover all of that now. No. And. Okay. So we, you mentioned that the the equivalent amount. So the the equivalent scheme in the south, i.e. the the one that's. Mm -hmm. That has has that just been used in Donegal or was it used in other? Areas. Um, when we, well, this is a very fast-moving situation. Yeah. So when we started to look at this, um, it was only in Donegal and Dublin. But mm. um, on, earlier this week, obviously, the level three restrictions were applied across the whole of the republic. So mm. it, it probably is in different areas. Um, their basic um, top-up is twelve hundred euros per three-week period, um, which um, equates to about three hundred and sixty pounds at current exchange rates per week. Okay. Per week. Right. And that would be that would be your your family-owned pub. In uh, um, well, Lifford, all, or St Johnson, yeah, on the other side. All small businesses, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it would go up much higher if you're in Dublin with a with the higher. Well, if you were in a very large business um, yeah. employing hundreds of employees, and I think the payment goes up to uh, two thousand five hundred euros per mm. three week period. And are you looking at the model for that? If, for the sake of argument, this would be this isn't if further if dairy and Stravan type mm. restrictions are introduced in Belfast. Would that be something that you would look? No, I think we we are proposing to apply this model in all areas to which these restrictions would be applied. If we got to a point where um, the majority of district council areas were in these kinds of restrictions, yeah. I think obviously that's a different kind of scenario, and the executive would have to consider other proposals. So, so, so the, the big restaurant hospitality location, the you know if you're the, the for the sake of argument, the, you know the, the biggest bar restaurant in the middle of Derry, mm -hmm. you're still only able to get. And I'm not saying this, but there are clear limitations. It's twelve hundred pounds, yes. and the presumably the minister's thinking is that any other additional support will have to be agreed with the treasury, and will have to be in the context of um, um, additional barn consequentials. Yes, or, and, and um, there's been some discussion about circus, circuit breakers, for example. Um, I think the the expectation would be um, additional funding from. Uh, Westminster in the event of any mm. kind of substantial circuit breaker kind of intervention. And, and just finally, if I may, Chair, um, specifically in relation to what Jim was talking about, really the, why the Finance Department has done this, and, and as I said, the Finance Department made a, 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 um, a pretty good job of, of getting schemes up and running earlier this year, but um, less so the Economy Department, perhaps. Were there specific conversations with them about whether they would be Responsible for this, I know they've had they had an announcement yesterday about working with Tourism NI and you know setting up a consultancy up, uh, scheme for 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 recovery. Was there a specific conversation for, with them about whether they would operate this? Yes, the, the permanent secretaries had a discussion yesterday about okay. who was best placed to take this forward. Um, I would say in relation to LPS, what we've got is a digital services team who are capable of putting together the online application form, um, a communications team who can deal with all the website and communications issues, mm. um, a team of staff who can deal with the um, applications and assess them, um, and who are based in the North West, and we've also got a legislative team and rate and policy division. So possibly uniquely um, in the Department of Finance, we have all of those capabilities in the one organisation, which can be joined up more easily than might be available elsewhere. So the Department of Economy possibly wouldn't have been able to respond at the same pace as we were able to, because we can join those functions up. Are you at all concerned that, if, as we look like we are entering, it may not be a full second lockdown, but it will almost definitely be uh, you know, a rolling period of increased restrictions, either in a kind of whack-a-mole way or in a uniform way across Northern Ireland? Are you concerned that your department will, by default, be the one that's the transmission mechanism for lots of the financial support? Or do you welcome? Would you rather do it and make sure it's done right? Um, I'm sure the other departments could do it right. I wouldn't say that the people can do it right. Um, the 
coronavirus situation has put all of us under a tremendous amount of pressure. There is no question about that, and the um, administration of these grant schemes adds pressure to the workload in LPS. There is no question about that, particularly it has added tremendously to the pressure in other departments who might have been able to take this forward, like the Department for Communities or the Department for the Economy. So we are all operating under tremendous pressure. I think we would all share the concern that if there is another extension or lockdown period, we would all be placed under a lot of pressure. I think we can safely say that we were very happy to see that the Department of Finance was willing to grasp the nettle. Mm. And Melissa. Uh, <coughs> no, the Falty, and I was Falty would have to chat to Foster. You are very welcome here today, and, and very welcome to is your message uh, that you bring to this committee. Um, just congratulations as well on the way that your department uh, to date has uh, met its obligations in respect of getting finance and that to the people that are most in need. Uh, and I'm totally confident as well too that uh, now in the immediate future that you'll be well able to meet that task in relation to the North West. And what's more, I suspect I suspect it's going to be good training ground because uh, uh, I do fear that uh, there will be other areas that will fall into the same category maybe in the very near future as well. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure you'd agree with me that why it's this uh, much needed resource at the present time uh, needs to be complemented in the future uh, by a replacement to the forelock scheme that we know is due to end now in the month uh, of October. I do think too that just uh, um, that over this last number of days I highlighted just another thing and that government does work. Uh, and again, I'd like to compliment our chair as well too for his engagement in, in that with the minister uh, and uh, your department then in responding to meet the immediate crises that many smaller businesses, in particular, in that as well too, in the northwest are going to be confronted with in the coming days. So, Gormid Mahaga, thank you very much. Philip, just a short one. I, um, it's just kind of in terms of. Uh, Answering the point of my constituent colleague Jim uh, in defence and support. Yeah, sorry, Philip, uh, we've got clever Jim, <laughs> thick Jim, and, and Clark Jim. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, I was just going to make the point. I, I don't think the businesses in Derry and Strabane uh, are, are going to be too concerned about which department uh, provides the financial assistance that they need. Uh, I think it's really good, uh, given you know some of the, the, the problems as an MLA I've encountered in terms of. The slowness, maybe, of government in previous uh, iterations. You no, know, that we have a minister that's prepared to grasp a nettle and get money out very quickly. Uh, now, I, I'm pretty sure the businesses up there would have would have wanted more money, but I think that, that you know, as you've pointed out, this is this is more than has been given in in the south and more than has been given in England. So that's welcome. It, it's not going to answer all the questions. I mean, all the executive, I think, are clear in the resolution that the North needs more money from, from uh, the British Exchequer, and we, we need to see the furlough scheme extended. In terms of the point that a number of people have asked about the potential for this being rolled out, uh, if need be, in the other council areas, is there a, 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 an amount of money ring-fenced within the department for such an inevitability? Um, in the um, SL1 letter, we identified that 3.5 million has been set aside initially for this, um, which would allow for the extension of the scheme to four council areas for four weeks in each area. So that would be a rough ballpark figure of what the, the cost might be if that kind of scenario happened. If it goes beyond that, obviously the executive will want to discuss what's the best well, way to respond. Unfortunately, we'll be in a different scenario if that occurs. Um, team. Uh, we don't have any further else. And I thank Ian. Thank you very much indeed. Coming for short notice to come and brief us is the rest of it. And thank you very much indeed. You pass our thanks back to the team and also the drafting team because it's been sort of quite a lot of work in a very short space of time. Okay, okay, thank well you very done. much. Thank you very much indeed. Team, uh, on that, therefore, the, I just want to say the purpose of the draft will, will be to implement the scheme which the Department has been designated to enact, and the proposed scheme implemented by the new draft will, will provide financial assistance to businesses whose ability to trade is directly affected by the re restrictions. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure for the Assembly. Uh, if we are content, I would like to put this to you, that the Committee has considered Department of Finance proposal for subordinate legislation SL1, the Financial Assistance Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we content? Are we in agreement? Agreed. Yeah. Thank you.
We move on to item number 13 on the agenda. It was the letter that I drafted after the meeting, uh, which is at page 205. The letter I drafted after the meeting, after I can't remember which number of debates we've had on uh, Brexit or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and it was, uh, as I mentioned in the Assembly when I was as, as available in Hansard, as was discussed with the Speaker at the time, and also with the chair of the uh, also chair of the executive committee, was uh, a letter from all the chairs uh, of the assembly to write to both to the United Kingdom and to the European Union to ask them to stop using Northern Ireland as a political football and actually put the people of Northern Ireland first. Uh, the language I drafted within the letter is what I felt at the time. Obviously, it hadn't come through the committee for your consideration. Uh, obviously, some of you will have different and alternative views on the particular issue. The one thing I would say is that I still think there is value in the Assembly, uh, based on the committees writing to the Speaker and then writing directly both to Barnier and to Frost, to put on our record that the wish we wish to see as a level playing field as possible across both the United Kingdom, but also to make sure that the implications in Northern Ireland are reduced to the absolute minimum. Everybody has said that they are there to support the Belfast Agreement. Everybody has said that they particularly want to see a minimal uh, soft-touch approach, and particularly bearing in mind that both our businesses and our consumers are likely to be hit with some considerable charges come the 1st of January. I think it would be opposite if we were in a position to collectively, as an assembly, from all sides of the assembly, to write to do that. That is the position I have. I am open for any comment. Lisa? Well, to the Chair, um, I think at our last meeting I made you very aware of my position was on the fact that you had announced to the assembly but hadn't uh, dealt with uh, uh, the issue within this committee. And I felt that was the appropriate place for you to have introduced that matter in the first instance. Uh, and secondly, that in introducing it, that a, a, a letter uh, of whatever shape or form it should take uh, would be uh, circulated so that we can agree to the content. Uh, and I questioned entirely uh, sort of the, um, the insinuation within your letter that where both were equally responsible, and I did not regard that to, uh, as being the case, and that I would see in many respects that those that uh, actually defend the rights of the people of the north of Ireland, where the majority of the people in the north of Ireland had voted to stay within Europe, that their rights were been defended, in fact, by those people who uh, represent Europe at the present time, and not by uh, the likes of Boris Johnson, who has run uh, both a coach and horses right through legislation in order for him to get his own way. Uh, he has sold the people of the north of Ireland out in the past, and he will continue to do that in the future as well. Too. Uh, as I say, my two points uh, to you at the time in the first instance was that that, that matter should have been discussed within this committee and that uh, if a letter was to be issued, it should have been circularised within this committee, and we would have had the opportunity of uh, expressing our opinion on that on it. Okay. Come. Any other comments? Chair, Chair, just to say that um, the content of the letter itself uh, is basically emphasising the point, a political point, that we, people, no matter where they come or what sector they represent, should use Northern Ireland as a political football in any of this. So with regards to the content of the letter, I'm there with you. Uh, and again, we can all make political points, uh, either in this room, because it's your right as a member, but really we want to see from a chair, and indeed a deputy chair, a collegiate approach representing the views of a committee going forward. And, and because your content was apolitical, I, I have no problems with it. Uh, and I think with regards to uh, this committee and my partnership with you, Chair, uh, I, I see uh, you know, you've been a very good chair of this committee and absolutely no problems whatsoever. Sometimes you just have to take a bull by the horns and run with it, and I see this as what you've done here. I think the fact that you've written to all the other chairs of the committee is a good thing because it's uh, sending information out, trying to gather a collegiate approach uh, to safeguard, to safeguard uh, businesses and the population of Northern Ireland at, at this time were, were fraught with change. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So sometimes it takes us to 
push out the boundaries, to live on the edge and see where it falls. And in that regard, I'm happy. I could go into a political diatribe tribe here, but it's, it's a bit rich from political parties who have for years in their older history been anti-EU. All of a sudden, twist on a pence, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a coin, whenever it suits them, because it's in their divisive nature. But I'll leave it there, Chair. You have my bag. Okay, sir. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I suppose first of a question: Has there been any response to this letter yet? Uh, no, no, I have not any response to it. Um, I would say uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, I think, uh, first in response to what Paul said, um, I with respect, would say that this is not an apolitical letter, but at the same time it's very difficult for politicians. We're all politicians. All letters we write and send are political. Um, that, so just with respect, this is not an apolitical letter. Um, can I, now that this letter has been sent, I would just, all I would say, and um, taking you at your word that your intention was to find a degree of consensus in this letter, I would say understanding that there are clear divisions in the Assembly and how we see both um, the subject of Brexit, but also implementation of the protocol, I would say perhaps uh, respectfully a more um, collegiate way of doing it might have been to discuss possible areas of uh, shared common ground that we as, a, as multiple parties in the Assembly could find. And for example, one of those areas would be around stressing to the UK and indeed the EU the need to agree a deal. That's probably something where every party and the Assembly could agree that it, we would be better off if there was a deal. Are we going to find complete agreement around how we emphasise or describe the protocol? We probably aren't. So uh, I, I would say that if the intention is to find consensus, then probably this letter doesn't do it. And it probably, if it's, if it's, there's a, no, there's a slightly kind of process point about whether you're sending it, you're sending it in your capacity as chair. It doesn't have the letterhead of committee for finance, but. Your address does state you're chair of the finance committee. So I would just request that in future, if it's going from you as chair of the finance committee, that we at least have the opportunity to discuss in advance um, the tone a little bit, because I think it is true, you know, flatly. And I don't want others. I think it wouldn't be productive for any of us to get into a, a, a debate on the EU. I say, speak as someone who is, uh, has changed my career entirely based on my view on Brexit, my view on the EU, my view of what's best for Northern Ireland and the entire island of Ireland in relation to Europe. And I, so, and I, but there's no point in me arguing till I'm blue in the face with other people who have a fundamentally different view on that. Albeit, I would just say that some of the, the, the views contained in here, I could say as someone who used to advise people as a civil servant apolitically, these aren't apolitical views. We could, we could have found a little more consensus. So just in future, I think it might, my suggestion would be that if we're going to send that, that kind of thing as a committee, that we discuss it. Yep. Pat. And so, not adding on to her, just with what Matthew said, I'll take all that on board. But this, the, the, the concerns that we all have openly expressed in our many debates that we all collectively do not want to see any impediments to trade east, west, or north, south. And all sides wish to see the interests of Northern Ireland put first. On those lines, I am in agreement with what you have tried to do, okay? What you honestly set out in order to try to do. And I would say that. Those follow where we are, I believe, anyhow, my own personal opinion, within the SDLP. So I can see nothing wrong with that, except maybe with what Matthew and, and a couple of others have said, that maybe we should maybe just have tried to debate it a little bit better. But I think your intentions were in the right place, Chair. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just very briefly, the letter has been sent. Yes. If I'd known about it, I'd want to stiffen it. <laughs> <laughs> With bush yeah, that's right. That's right. It's good to it has been said. We could, we could uh, really, I, I suspect we just should accept the reality and move on. What you're trying to say, Jim, is that I've already made my point politically, and I've made it by putting it out in the public domain. So that is, so that is the that. So I've, I have achieved the aim. Is that what you're about to say? No, I, I'm just saying. <laughs> I do see the the merit in endlessly discussing this. Uh, some members have objected to other things being discussed on the basis that the horse is bolted. So I think this horse is well and truly bolted. Um, Sorry, just to the chair. I'd like to come in again? Yeah, certainly. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is not a case of the horse having bolted. 
This is a case of ensuring uh, good practice within this committee. Now, I'm a member of another committee as well, too, where there were pains to point out that the people who speak for the committee, in fact, as the chair and the vice chair, they also were at pains that they only could speak in that context whenever all of the people were in agreement with what the position of that particular committee was at. Uh, in the event of anyone else making comment on, we'll say, the same subject matter, they do it entirely uh, just as an individual MLA in, in their own right, but not as a member of that committee. Uh, and I think that the same should apply in this committee as well, to, uh, as it should in all committees, if it went to that, rather than having a situation where you have people often present themselves as speaking for the committee. And I've had to check people within our meetings here that they don't speak for the committee, not unless they are there presenting what is exactly the committee's position on a particular matter. And I think, Chair, that you are in exactly the same situation as well. Do you chair this committee, and in particular as Chair, the responsibility and onus is with you that when you do speak, if you are speaking in context of the committee, that you are reflecting the committee's view. Now, in this case, you sent out a letter, not as the leader of the Unionist Party, not in your individual role as an MLA, but as the chair of this committee. And as such, it was on you the onus to ensure that you had talked to this committee about what it was that you were sending that letter out on, and that that letter should have been discussed here first and foremost. And I do think that, unlike the implication here, oh, the horse has bolted, so it's all done and dusted. No, it's not all done and dusted. Because you see, next week or the week after, you could end up doing exactly the same thing again if we don't turn around now and decide that this is the way we actually operate. And I think that you're well enough aware of that yourself, Chair. Well enough aware of that yourself. And I think it's incumbent on everyone here to ensure that they support that particular position as well. Not about whether or not they agree with the content of your letter as it is at the present time, and I don't agree with it. Irrespective of what the content was, that is not the salient point. The salient point is that that letter was circulated, or it was announced even it was going to be circulated in the Assembly, but not discussed both within this committee. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Your point is noted, Melissa. Um, I must admit I took precedence from other committee chairs. I noticed that the chair of the Health Committee had done something previously. And indeed, for me, my ent entire intent was to try and draw something a bit together and try and bring the Assembly together, and particularly from the perspectives that we have across the Assembly, to get to a position where we would be able to say something that came from a combined voice, rather than the division that seemed to be marking every single Assembly debate that we had at the moment. But, Melissa, your points have been noted. And Jim? Could I just say that I, I, myself and Paul, I think, are the only other two members who have been chairs of committees, I think. Emily McGuigan, have you been a chair? Mm. Um, what I would say is that there are occasions when you have to make uh, an intervention when it's not possible to um, consult the committee. I always made a point of consulting the vice chair uh, before I, I made a statement. But you're not just chairing a meeting, you also have a leadership role uh, as uh, the chair of the committee, and you can be called upon at times to do things at, at short notice. So, as I say, I agree with Mr Alistair, uh, the letter could easily have gone a lot further, but I was happy with its content, and I think there was no attempt to undermine this committee or, or to cause any dissent. And you have to give your chairs, as others do, other committee chairs from all parties, have a bit of slack and discretion. They have not to wait until there is a committee meeting before every decision. But I just say, for future reference, I think if the chair and the vice chair both agreed on the content to something, then we can safely let it let it go out. I would just put a final point on that, and I, and I say again with respect, this wasn't about routine committee of finance business. This was about a very distinct, particular, controversial, possibly the most controversial subject facing this place. This was about routine correspondence with the minister or supplementary estimates. That's one thing. With respect, it wasn't. It was about something new and novel that this committee was doing. So, in future, I, I think it's a reasonable point to make that we have a. If we're going to if it's going to be done under the auspices of the committee, I think it's not unreasonable that we discuss it. But I think the letter having been sent now, I, I think it's, I think I'm, you know, I'm, the point, my point's been made, and you know. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, members of the committee. Thank you for I think we've aired that item on the agenda. I will not be submitting the letter any further because it has had the effect that uh, I wish to have. But again, may I put on record as uh, as an MLA, uh, as somebody who's been involved in many debates uh, in this assembly recently, and they seem to be going on with monotonous regularity every week. I think we, as an assembly together, must seriously be thinking about how we can come together rather than dividing apart, because this is an issue that is, we can say it's all the UK, we can say it's all the EU, but the most single important issue is how it affects the people of Northern Ireland, who that's the people we represent. And if we're content with that, we move on to the next item of the agenda which is the response by the Department of Ge to General Registry Office Northern Ireland to churches on page 207. Jim. Chairman, I am very disappointed in this because uh, the Department had all, or the GRO had over three and a half weeks trying to respond. What has come back is totally inadequate. It does not explain anything. Yeah. I was expecting a, a paper explaining who exactly did what and when, who authorised it, who, who, who checked it before it went out. It caused enormous concern to Christian churches throughout Northern Ireland who have had the right to carry out marriage ceremonies for one and a half centuries. So, at a stroke of a pen, the implication was that that would be removed. Now, the Department have accepted it as a mistake and apologised, but we have not got to the bottom of why it happened. Mm -hmm. There is one thing making a few typographical errors. There is another thing trying to remove a fundamental right of all churches in Northern Ireland to perform marriage ceremonies, and it was a complete faux pas, a complete hash was made of this very important issue. I also want to know what action was taken against whoever drafted this wrongly, uh, what steps have been taken to make certain it never happens again. And what five lines in a piece of paper doesn't come anywhere near. What, what we've been told is what we've known all along. It doesn't come anywhere near it. The only thing I know about this is that neither the minister nor the permanent secretary saw that letter before it went out. That I do know, that, because I've asked them directly. Beyond that, I'm still totally in the dark. And all I would suggest is we go back and ask for a full explanation as to what happened, and not a, a short letter which is only trying to, 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 to brush us off and, and in a busy period and deflect our attention from the subject. Any other comments? Paul? Yeah, I take the point that it was uh, written in error, and we all make mistakes, and we all can make mistakes, and it's human error. But the impact of this error had a much wider field and scope. And again, the explanation here basically tells us what we already know. Some of us, some of us, are steeped in this uh, issue. Uh, and have been, uh, and some of us have received a lot of correspondence from church members who are very aggrieved at this, who were very worried. It, it ran a lot of people up the walls to a certain degree at the start before it was clarified. Now, again, it was clarified quickly enough, but the actual scope and, and effect that this one error had caused a lot of pain and worry. And whilst I will take it at face value that it was an error, I believe, there, I believe that we should be, as legislators, worried about the pressure that can be put on organisations. And because of that, uh, I see this as a very serious error. And, and there needs to be safeguards to ensure that something like this could never ever happen again, because it could be deemed and seen as an implied threat or a conditioning of something else coming down the line, and that's not where we want to be at all. Coercing any organisation or person into a position is not the sort of government that I want to see uh, in this regard. So. I would really worry about the future if an error like this is, has been allowed to happen and there was no safeguards to stop it going out. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, just to say, Chair, I think one of the most alarming things about it is that the Deputy Registrar, who seems to have been the author, 
and who was the lead official in respect of the legislation, seemed to have a total misunderstanding of what the legislative impact was. That's one of the scariest things about it. Um, sort of, team, just with due regard to the letter, when I read it the first time, I thought, okay, there's been an administrative error. But this was probably one of the most um, controversial yeah. pieces of legislation that is likely to come through. And the way it was read and interpreted amongst many of our sort of church going communities was they did treat it with a, a considerable degree of concern. And bearing in mind that it was quite clear when you read the legislation and the process that was coming through that it wouldn't have applied in the way of that. And the fact that nobody seemed to have the foresight before it went out to have checked that and understood the degree of concern that would have raised, that raises to me some concerns. And particularly, to be quite frank, the letter we have received I don't think goes far enough in explanations of why it happened. And again, it doesn't really explain how the processes are going to be put in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, um, on one hand, yes, they have acknowledged their error, which it was uh, good to see that they've acknowledged they've corrected it. But I do think there's probably I would probably like to see a bit more information about how it happened and why we reached the point where this came through, because I think we owe that to many of the sort of people who have contacted us, particularly from the sort of the church and religious groups who have raised concerns about this issue. Well, Mr. Chairman, we've seen. An example earlier, when the department gets it absolutely right, and we mm -hmm. acknowledge that, and now we've got an example where they've got it totally wrong, and we want an explanation. And the churches are feeling very, very uneasy because many believe the next step will be some attempt through the courts to force churches to carry out what are known as same-sex marriages. And certainly, this letter did not, in any way, allay those fears. Um, so, therefore, I think we need to get a full paper. From the department, and if that doesn't work, to bring them before this committee and ask them some very difficult questions, and maybe they'll, that'll concentrate their minds. But I am not that slow that I'm going to be bought off with that type of response about any issue, even a lot less serious than this. And that, to me, is an attempt to fob us off and I hope that we'll forget about it. Well, I'm not going to forget about it, and I want a full report from the department as to how we got to this position. Matthew? Um, so I. Um so, uh, the clerks may be able to rem remind me when this, when this came. I, mean, I may not have been in the room whenever this came for the committee, whenever this was that we wrote to the department. Um, I, I suppose two things. They've, we seem, we've gotten from the department now an explanation of why a letter was sent. Um, I would be very cautious about um, spending significant amounts of, amount of the committee's time looking at um, a, uh, an issue which is not core to the committee's business. I appreciate there is a significant amount of strength of feeling among some members of the committee in relation to it. Um, uh, but given what we discuss every week is our the, you know, the burden of our duties in relation to going through private members' legislation, dealing with COVID finances, dealing with the impact on public finances of Brexit, the implementation of NDNA and reform of our civil service, everything that we are responsible for scrutinising. I do not know why we are spending more time talking about this. Um, I am not going to get into the broad debate about same-sex marriage. It is clear that there's a, uh, there are divisions uh, about, uh, within this committee about how people think of it, but I am not convinced that this is a, a serious enough issue that our committee should be spending a huge amount of time on, on unless I am missing something. Well, quite simply, Matthew, had we through got chair, the through, full, the through the chair, quite, Mr. Chairman, yes. had we got a full explanation, we wouldn't have had to discuss it any further. It's the prevarication of the department that's causing the problem. All we're asking is for Jim and his team to write another letter asking for a full explanation. They're watching us now, by the way, and they know what's coming, and they have the report ready. I have no doubt. They just don't want to release it. And this will form 5% of what we've discussed today, and hopefully 2% of next week's activities. But I know where he's coming from, from his angle of uh, 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 and not really caring about this issue. But to a lot of folk in Northern Ireland, this is very important to them. And they do not. I don't doubt it. 
Yeah. But there's many, many in your party, Matthew, you don't see it that way, and I accept that. But there are many churchgoers in this province who do. Uh, just, just to draw a line under this, and I accept what uh, Jim says, and I also accept what Matthew says, but this is an issue that we want a, a more fuller response from the General Registry Office, uh, General Register Office. And at the present moment in time, that's not one part of government that is being overwhelmed by sort of COVID and COVID responses. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what issue it was to get a letter like that back to this committee on an issue that creates so much uh, annoyance to a large section of the Northern Ireland community. I think the response. I think I would expect a more fulsome response. And as chair of the committee, and uh, with your uh, commitment, I would like to go back to the uh, general registry office and ask them for a, a more detailed. Uh, a brief on what happened and what they're planning to do to uh, uh, sort out the issue. That's not adding excessively to the committee's workload. Gemma? Yeah, just a point. Um, they have said that they've apologised to all churches and it was a genuine error. So I, I don't really know what else they can say, to be honest. So. I, to, to be honest, I would have to check, and again, sort of, sort of declaration of interest. I'm, I'm obviously a member of a, a select vestry and sort of quite involved in the Church of Ireland. Uh, this issue did create an awful lot of annoyance and anger, and I don't. I haven't had any members of the Church of Ireland coming to me and saying that they've either received a uh, apology, or in many way that apology has been accepted. And I imagine I, I can't speak for the Roman Catholic Church, the Methodists, or the Presbyterians, but I can't imagine the response from them would be much different from from there. So I think, bearing in mind. We are not asking us to do additional work. We are asking for them to go back and give us a more fulsome response that can come back to us a letter. I think that is an appropriate response if we are agreed. Chair, yeah, Sir, Chair, oh. Gemma raises a very important point there. Um, so if they have apologised to churches, how did they apologise to the churches? If they have sent a circular out or a letter out to them? I haven't seen it. I, I don't think I We have seen it as a committee. So again, that is that's another reason why you would want to write back to them just and, and ask for all correspondence that they have given to the churches yeah. uh, on this. Yeah. If we are content. Good. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, response from the Committee for the Economy and the Minister for the Economy regarding travel industry and COVID financial support on page 209. Chair, this is a massive issue. Uh, this is just one of those sectors of industry that has been really hard hit by the COVID-19 uh, travel, in this case, travel restrictions, but are not are in a very unique place because it's not as if they just close and furlough staff, and then you know tuck down, knuckle down, and hope to get through it with a wee bit of financial support, and then get out the other side. Travel agents, in some cases, especially the more independent privateer ones, they're having to work more hours now. Paying back refunds, yeah. which is completely, it's completely shredding them, shredding them of any capacity to recover, and yet they're actually working harder to put themselves in that position for the good of their customers. Uh, this is a very unique, and and when 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 we always talk in the chamber about the travel industry being affected by COVID nineteen. We seem to always look towards the airports and the airlines, and I get that. I get that. But there are going to be so many of these smaller travel agents who just will not be able to survive because they're doing the right thing and they're working so many hard hours to pay back money, and it's dwindling their resources and their capacity. And I think on this unique occasion with this unique industry, I think. The executive really needs to consider this very, very carefully as to what sort of sustained support they can give. It, it won't be enough. It won't be enough just to open up the airways again and hope that everybody goes on that holiday they've yearned for. That won't be enough. Th th these people need support and they need it now. Um, um, I just asked the members if I don't know if anybody was in the chamber when the first minister when asked a question. I can't remember who asked the question. But she said that you know she she was going to take a, a personal interest in issues to do with travel agents, and I don't know if the executive department has we have seen any correspondence or 
and obviously, I hate to say this, but this is another area that should be naturally sitting within the Department of the Economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet again, we're picking up on the things. Matthew? Yeah, I was going to further, because I agree, Paul put it quite well, that there's a, even the response, I th from my own understanding, Peter Hall has attached a response, hang on, that, this is a, is that a, res that's a response from the Department Martin. to the Economy Committee? Yeah. That, that on, on 210. So even that seems to conflate tourism. So obviously, tourism NI, tourism Ireland are working on, you know, and that is, in a sense, that's more, that's more, that's more connected with the economy, you know, the, the hospitality and experience economy here, and including pubs, restaurants, hotels, etc. Yeah. Um, th that's a different kettle of complete. In a sense, that's a categorically. Obviously, they will engage with them, but that's a, a different category to travel agents. And it's slightly worrying that the department seems not to have understood, and this has come, I mean, come from an official, that it seems to not have completely understood that distinction in their response. Um, uh, because, you know, travel agents, I presume, I, mean, I probably numerically, it's a, it's a, it's a considerably smaller employment uh, uh, number of people, presumably employ, will employ fewer people than the hospitality industry and inward tourism, clearly, but um, it is concerning that travel agents generally aren't getting um, clarity, and I suppose the most concerning thing about this correspondence is it's not entirely clear that the department have even understood the request that's come from the committee. Yeah, I'm sort of... Uh, yep. I was just going to agree with what Paul and others have said. There is a unique aspect to this, because it's the fact that Money that was in the bank mm -hmm. is now to yeah, exactly. pay back. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote to the economy minister, but this is no others did. And frankly, the answer back was the standard look at all the things we've done, but it didn't mm. address the issue. Uh, I, was, I do note that in the letter back on page 213, it says that the final, it, well, it tells us first of all there's been no bid, which is disappointing, but it tells us that the finance minister is meeting. The Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents. I think we should ask to be updated on the outcome of that meeting, mm -hmm. uh, so as we can keep this matter very much on the radar. Indeed. And the other question, again, and sort of thing, the issues about the bid is quite an interesting thing because one of the concerns we've had is the bids that have gone from the Department of Economy to the Department of Finance to be able to ask for specific issues. The fact that First Minister is raised an issue on this. I think there's a question here that we would like to, we first of all would like to get a readout from the finance minister's meeting with the, uh, with the uh, travel agency industry, the uh, Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, if we could get a readout from that meeting as well. But I would also like us to write to the Minister for the Economy and, the, or sorry, the First Minister and the Minister of Economy to ask whether they are considering putting a, a bid in to support uh, travel agents. And I think we could then, bearing in mind we've got the next item of business, which is uh, the response from the Department in relation to financial support to the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, if we wrote back to them and said that is what we were proposing to do to get some updates of information so we're better informed if we were content. Agreed. Agreed? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. One caveat, you said you were writing to the First Minister. Obviously, you would be writing to the Joint First Ministers. Yeah, sir. Well, it's first and well, it's, uh, first yeah. But I think, um, first Philip, first just, just on that point, I think um, Minister Foster specifically raised it. I think that, 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 was, that was the difference because she, it was a question in, on the floor. So, yeah, it would be to the, you know, it would be to the First and Deputy First Minister. But I think specifically she raised it. And I just want to, you know, t I'm not trying to put her in the spot, but she did seem to be over that particular degree of the detail, and I think that would be quite appropriate to get a response on that. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to the next item, a response from the Northern Ireland Audit Office on its Northern Ireland Budget Process Report on page 214. Uh, members, do we have any comment? I'd like to seek your agreement to forward to the Department uh, in order to inform the development of the Memorandum of Standing on the Budget Process, if we are content. Uh, from the Committee of the Economy regarding uh, personal protective equipment making buy in Scotland on page 215. Do we have any comments? Sorry, the Committee of the Com Economy, sorry. Noted. Noted. 
Uh, if we move on to page 216, response from the Department <coughs> the Press for information on the review of arms length bodies, page 216. Do you have any comments? If I think it would be appropriate if we asked the Department to give us some oral evidence on the outcome of the review as soon as it becomes available. I think that would be appropriate. <coughs> And when we're looking at our forward work strands on sort of reform of the civil service and the process of government, I think that's quite important. Okay. Uh, next item of business, uh, team, is from Kingspan Installation Limited regarding the Department for Finance's cons consultation on amending the building regulations. It's page 220. Chair, I had a Zoom meeting with Kingspan this morning on these issues. I must say, when I first read the correspondence, I was a bit sceptical, but when you talk to them, I think there is a point relevant to the regulations that may cause us, whenever the regulations come before us, to, to maybe hear from Kingspan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tim, to, when I first read this, and going to Matthew's point about what is sort of core and germane to the Finance Committee uh, to be dealing with what seem to be sort of building regulations. When you think of all the things this committee deals with, I was wondering where are we this and what is the degree of detail we have to consider this. However, when you actually read the building regulations and the implications of things to do with the Grenfell fire and some really sort of significant areas of safety, I and to the clerk and both to the uh, deputy chair, I expressed a degree of unease that I'm not suitably swept, sorry, suitably qualified to understand some of the issues that may be brought before this. And I thought before we would have, uh, and before we invite Kingspan to come and speak to us, I think I would like to have an update from people who are expert in these regulations to come and brief the committee so that we as a committee can actually do our role properly as scrutiny and being properly informed of some of the key issues. And to that degree, I would like your agreement so that we can write to the department to ask that provide copies of all consultation responses immediately after the closing date. I would like to contact Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service and the Health and Safety Executive if they ask if they have responded to the consultation and ask that they provide views to the committee on the suitability of the regulations as drafted. I would probably like to ask Reyes to identify any experts from academia or any other experts who could come and give a view to the committee and start to schedule an evidence session so that we're available for that. Sir Matthew. Uh, have you finished? Sir, well, I was just going to um, chair, if I may. First of all, I should declare an interest in the sense that before I became an MLA, I was, uh, briefly worked for a communications consultancy, which worked in some of these areas, and including a short project and with Kingspan. I, do, I, I didn't work. Um, uh, directly on it, but um, uh, but I think you're right. I think the um, building regs is in the post Grenfell context is something that um, uh, we, though it's useful to hear from Kingspan, and there will be lots of n no doubt important technical detail in there. I think it's important that we get a fulsome picture in addition to theirs, and entirely legitimate and welcome that they would contact us. But so I would, in addition to declaring my interest. Second, what you've just said around finding, I think it's also particularly useful to um, to get um, uh, raised to look at um, as other expert uh, evidence, you know, within the context of not spend, you know, devoting an inordinate amount of time to it. But one final point is that, frankly, in the like some of those experts will have been will have given evidence to the to the Grenfell Committee inquiry. I'm, we're talking about an entirely different. Order of magnitude, but there will be useful people there if they can find. Yeah. Uh, I, and Paul, oh, sorry. Yeah, Chair, just on this again, I, I, I suspect all finance committee members will have received a call to ask for a meeting with some of these companies involved. Uh, because the Chair had contacted me last week, I'd, I've held off organising a Zoom in case that we would do something collectively as a committee. I do think there's a process here to be followed, and that would be that the department have to do their job with regards to the consultation. I do agree that we need to make sure that we are as clued in as possible. None of us will be experts in this field, I would suggest. So we do need to make sure that we get as much uh, information as possible from as 
varied of source, sources as, 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 as possible, but also with expertise involved. Uh, so again, I don't know. Is, is, it, is it that we all go off in our own merry way and meet with these organisations, or is there something that we need to do more orchestrated? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I do think that we have to give the, the department time to do their consultation with regards. I can't remember how many weeks they've given for this consultation. We can do work in the interim, build up that capacity. The consultation closes on Friday. Friday, right. Well, I think we do need to then... I, I can see why some of these companies are trying to contact us urgently. Yeah. Uh, so I do think we need to go back and say to them, look, you know, give us a space on this and, and we'll, we'll call you whatever we need to do uh, in order, as a committee in order to try and inform ourselves. I, I, so I, do, I just, I'm so, possibly groping in the dark as to what, how we actually move forward here. I, I would suspect some of these companies, it would be a better job for them to meet us all collegiately, collectively, as opposed to having 11 Zoom meetings over a course of 11 days. Yeah. Um, yep. when, when, when I was in the health committee, we had a lot of requests like this. And we, what we did was that we set up meetings which weren't full committee meetings, but an opportunity for all the members of the committee to come along and receive a briefing. And I think we also have to remember what public safety is absolutely paramount. This company employ, and similar companies employ large numbers of people in Northern Ireland, in mm -hmm. places like Ballyclare and Portadown. <coughs> And therefore, I think it's important that we don't introduce regulations which don't achieve greater safety, but they end up making a lot of people unemployed. So I was going to suggest to Jim, um, Clark, Jim, as it were, um, it, 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 I think we've done this before. You've had opportunities to meet outside groups which were not formally minuted meetings, but which were organised by the committee. And I'd be very keen uh, to sit down with this company, indeed any company who's concerned about this, because. My understanding is that the, reg the change in the legislation we as a committee have to deal with. Yes. Is that right? Even though it seems to be a bit of a tangent to our main work, but building regulations fall into DFP, yeah. so therefore it falls under our table. And we all were obviously horrified with what happened with Grenfell Fire, the, the Grenfell Fire, but um, we need to make certain and that a, and a reaction to that doesn't lead to a large number of people unemployed, and secondly, doesn't actually achieve greater safety anyhow. I think there's, there is, uh, just speaking personally and as sort of uh, chair of this committee and sort of representing you all in many respects, I want to make sure that we're all suitably informed and able to ask the appropriate questions as we go forward. Now, how we achieve that, I think Jim uh, has made a good suggestion that we uh, arrange for some briefings that outside the sort of the hmm. normal committee process. And I'll liaise with Jim to see how we um, how we can facil facilitate that to make that work. Um, can we write to uh, I think it's uh, the people representing Kingspan or Kingspan Epic? Fergal Murphy. Murphy. Yeah. Can we write to them and say that's the approach that we're taking? We're informing ourselves, and then we'll be delighted to take a briefing. So, so if them. members are content with the other suggestions that you've made, yes. then so far we can. Yeah. Yep. Take that approach. It would be difficult to, to facilitate a round table at the minute in any forum other than through Starleaf. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it is legislation, so it would probably be preferable to get a or eleven sessions if members want to, to consider it in that way. Yeah. Again, that could be facilitated through Starleaf with I, I think t there are three organizations that have written to the committee. Yeah. Uh, so far. So uh, about the same Starleaf evidence session. With those three organisations, would cover it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Go ahead, Matthew. I was just checking with the clerk. Thanks, sir. That the three organisations are have written in, in relation to the same regs that Kingspan have. Yes. 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 Two other organisations. Yes. Right. Who are who are they? A M W Advocate and Epic. I think M W Advocate are probably the consultancy acting for. Yeah. Yeah. Kingspan, and who else are those? Kingspan. That's the third. And King's Band. Sorry, who's the third? Sorry, there, I mean, there, there was Epic, 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 Epic. Okay. MWA Advocates, and King's Band. Okay, thank you. And uh, can I ask your agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence, and to note the information requests of the department on routine papers circulated on the 25th of September and the 2nd of October 2020? Do I have your agreement? Great. Are we content? Great.
If we move on to the forward work programme, an updated forward work programme for September or December is at page 237, if you'd like to turn to that, so we're consulting that. Okay, I'd like to remind members that the committee previously agreed to receive oral evidence from Land and Property Service. I draw members' attention to the clerk's paper at two, page 242 regarding the LPS fraud and other matters. Um, one of the issues that came up, I think it was in the Finance Minister when he made a statement, was about a, and I need to check this, so uh, please have my indulgence, I've, I've all got the name wrong, but it was Project um, Epic, or some part of the IT system. And remember, there was, a, there was an issue we dealt with with the BT and the IT system with LPS and the funding and some of the issues to do with being overcharged for it. Yes. And it seems one of the issues that I think if there is there was additional money, I think it was 2.5 million, was being put into the budget line for LPS for uh, systems and future systems. I can't see how that marries in with the business that we were supposed to be going out to a separate contract and the rest of it. So when we're discussing the issues to do with the LPS fraud matter. I'd also like to bring that up for a discussion with the LPS as well, if we are content. Sorry, uh, what date does that, that, that the intend to bring up the fraud matter? Um, I don't think we've got a date yet. There's no date for it, no. Not, not a date yet, yet for my <coughs> Why is there something you want to be there no, for? No, or? No, that's quite all right. When you were talking about the ICA, I was looking for it in the programme, right, and no, I couldn't sorry, see no. it. No, no I just brought that up. Ask the member agreement to the department to provide information as suggested in the paper in advance. And those are any other. Are there any other issues we wish to explore with LPS? Okay, thank you. Move on to the next item. Uh, the minister has responded to the request for information. Oh, sorry, to be clear. So next week we're doing clause by clause in my bill. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we're, we haven't got that far yet, but I thought we'd done. The Forward work program. Okay. No, this is this is. Um, not bad. There's, yeah, there's, I, I still, there's still a lot to consider. There's the still a lot to consider in the forward work program, okay. Jim. We're still on our way. Uh, the minister has responded to the request for information EU exit related matters, which will impact on the committee's work on page two four four. Ask members if they have any comments. Uh, can we have the seek agreement to forward this to the EU Affairs Manager and for the Committee for the Economy? Great. Great. Uh, Four members of the Commons International Trade Committee is taking evidence today in free ports. This evidence will include oral evidence from the Strategic Policy Division, Department of Finance and the Federation of Small Businesses. Uh, would the Committee like to review view the Hansard of this and decide whether we want to take an evidence session on free ports, particularly how it relates to taxation and fi uh, finance? Great. Uh, can I just on on report, Chair? If I may, I mean it's a it's a fact. It is an interesting subject. There are it, it is there are strong arguments for and against. I know the FSB and others here. There are particular arguments for it here that are distinct from um, GB, as it were. But I would just say that it, um, if it's given the other, as I always want to say, given the other pressures of work. If we are doing it sooner rather than later, I would say it should be later rather than sooner, given all the other work we have to do. Noted. Um, if we don't need to do it before Christmas, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Not that I'm anti the, the rest of strong view against them, I'm just saying it. Noted. <laughs> You've got a Melusa stare and a noted with it, with it as well. Uh, ministers agreed to the committee's request that they attend the meeting on the 21st of October 2020 to discuss details of the impact of not having a UK budget on the timing, content and opportunity for Committee for Finance scrutiny and consultation on the Assembly budget. I uh, also remind members of the meeting last week the Committee agreed to consider oral evidence sessions in relation to the public sector reform and other future items on the forward work programme with considering evidence sessions. If I can have your agreement to start scheduling oral sessions as outlined in the Committee's operational plan. It, um, sorry, on or Committee scheduling oral sessions on something in particular, did you say? 
there, or? Say again? Or did you say, you were, was there something in particular you were going to schedule oral sessions on that you were saying? No, we just agreed to the scheduling oh, of oral sessions. I, I was going to make a suggestion, uh, and it's not contradictory to what I was just saying about our time pressures, but given we are taking evidence from the Minister about not having a UK budget this autumn, and we all we know that's going to create particular pressures for our budget process, do we want to revisit the idea of getting someone from the UK Treasury to give us evidence the, in the devolved spending team as to why, uh, as to how they see the impact? Any other comments? Can we ask we can. the UK Treasury team, have we not in the past tried to get hold of the UK Treasury team to come and talk to us? To the committee since I've been on it? I'm not yeah. sure if we have. Uh, it must have been, um, been something else. I, must have I think it was, I mean, it was discussed but not agreed. It's it was discussed but not agreed. Uh, well, I, I, I would say that it's a, it's a Can you make a formal proposal? You want me to make a formal proposal? Yep. I suppose my formal proposal was no, the no, no, it's all right. Go ahead. So we've got the, it down. The, the, we um, need to know who we need to ask exactly. Go ahead, Matthew. I, I, I would maybe just think about the, the precise person. I think the that the committee um, request in the coming weeks at a time which fits with the, the rest of our forward work programme, an oral evidence session from someone at HM Treasury, a senior person, director level at the uh, at the least, to to talk about. Um, the lack of a budget and its impact on devolved spending right. devolved would be my attempts. proposal. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll second that uh, because I do think it is important. Because whilst the minister made a decision or made a statement to the house this week on the lack of a spending review, I, I want to know and understand how that really does impact on Northern Ireland, uh, because surely there is a play at the present time process for next year's budget um, and what they don't have is a if you like a, a total detailed figure but surely those people who are very smart and clever in that department are still working on something and and surely surely it's they're not surely they're not sitting waiting until the Chancellor of the Exchequer makes a, a budget because that would be a fundamental weakness in that any devolution settlement. So what are they doing? How are they doing it without that grand total figure of a budget? And and why 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 is it impeding why is it impeding the work that they could do uh, with the departments and the committees, because I know, uh, sitting in the Justice Committee, we have already had a briefing only last week on, on budgetary matters. So how, how much of an impedance, I'm, I'm sure it's mighty, don't get me wrong, but, but how much of an impedance and then how do they get around it? Okay. Um, just further to that, just if you want to add to your um, proposal, obviously there's implications of the finance bill that hasn't arrived yet. Obligate. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion about what's happening with the um, internal market bill and the finance bill, but also the implications that it's likely to have on the devolution settlement after that. Yeah. So, look, I don't know when the finance bill is coming through, but one of the things that might be very useful is if we schedule the, um, this session after the, fin the provisions of the finance bill have gone through. So we'll be able to get a full update on how it is likely to affect the devolution settlement going forward, because that will be new. That will be new ground, and I think that will be very opposite when it comes to discussion how we do our multi-year budget and process. Lisa, yes, uh, the chair, just I think that might be new ground, all right, yeah. Uh, but in terms of uh, some of the ground Mr. Frew just covered there a few minutes ago, uh, I thought that he was uh, adequately answered uh, in the assembly. Uh, whenever the Minister of Finance actually had addressed that same question that you had put to the Minister of Finance at the time, why it was that he wasn't coming forward with the budget at present, uh, when he said, well, what part does one not understand that if you haven't been given the budget, you're not in a position to bring forward then a budget, we say, for uh, the north of Ireland. Uh, but in terms of having someone from, we'll say, the UK Treasury um, coming to this committee and giving us information, additional information on how the whole thing works, well and good, I'd accept that as well too. Okay. I think that's our, all those in favour say aye. 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 Just on that, Chair, the Minister also said that he was confident he would bring forward a budget by the springtime. Springtime's too late, so again, uh, 
we need to find out the processes, the processes and the mechanisms at play when he gets a budget settlement and when he doesn't get a budget settlement and how that plays in. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, move on to the next item, page 247. There's an offer from the committee to receive a professional development workshop on effective questioning and questioning skills. I understand the department or the health committee have already had that? That's right, Chair. Yeah. When? It doesn't seem they've used it, any of it. Uh, no, I think it was quite recently, Chair. And I think some of the feedback was that it was an hour and 30 minutes long and that uh, an hour would possibly be more appropriate. <laughs> So if members uh, are content to proceed on that basis. Uh, just on that issue, uh, at the um, committee's liaison or the chair's liaisons group, we raised the issue of training opportunities and training opportunities. Uh, we've raised the issue again about professional development for MLAs. That's an issue that's gone through as well. And are the other areas of training. I understand through the WIPs there's been a push through from training that's being provided by um, Politics Plus here. To going to individual members and also to staff as well. So whether this is part and parcel of that process, I think we might get some more information to see if we can avail of that, because I think that may already have been covered in other areas. Okay, Jim, sorry, now answer your bit. Uh, vice members, the formal clause by clause consideration of the function of government miscellaneous bill has been provisional scheduled for next week's meeting. Uh, the question is, do we want to have more time to consider the bill? Or should we be moving then to formal clause by clause? Comments? We've had our discussion last week. We went through all the clauses. And as the Bill Clark pointed out to us, the next stage is the clause by clause. clause. So why would we wait? I'm content to take it next week. Uh, we just, I guess, how long do we think clause? Do we anticipate clause by clause will take more than one session, or are we, or will that just depend on how? No, we vote on the clauses whether we agree to them or not. Uh, indeed, but but we we anticipate that will be done and dusted next week. I must say, my experience of doing bills with departmental bills and other once you've had your discussion, you come to clause by clause. It's pretty much a yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've had a substantial mm -hmm. discussions over two sessions. Yeah. Okay. Are we content? Great. <coughs> Members, are you content with the forward work programme as it sits? Thank you. Oh. Sorry, Claire, just uh, uh, sure in advance of that, uh, are members content to have a closed session with Bill Clark prior to uh, the meeting or the start of the meeting next week to, yeah. to go through the process? Yes, indeed. I think that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other business? Or we moved into secret session. The Queen. Sure. Go ahead. Um, if you will indulge me, just it's tomorrow. Pat, we always indulge you. All right, thanks. And I have a well, we have anyhow. There's an APG on fair banking, and I know that there are five members here that that went on that at the start. And if anyone was free tomorrow at twelve o'clock, if they send in tonight, I think we've got about seventy-two responses back to it. But there is a good lineup of people on it. We have our finance minister, Conor Murphy, who's coming. Kevin Hollenrick, he's co-chair of the APPG over in Westminster. Um, we have uh, there's myself doing a little bit. Angela McGowan of the CBI, uh, Samantha Barnes, the CEO of Business Banking Resolution, who intend to come here uh, uh, in December in order to bring that over here, and that would be a lunch for that. Uh, in order to come, and we we'll have asked the retired uh, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who was the longest-serving Chancellor uh, uh, in the United Kingdom government, and he's coming on for about a half an hour of a question and answer session on that. I, I just think that he was the man that guided us through that last recession, and I believe there's a lot of experience that we can pull from it. From this committee, we're bringing forward ideas and for how we are going to try to grow the economy where we all live in and call home, which is Northern Ireland, and goes for anything which is went back out of that. So it's an opportunity tomorrow, and I would appreciate if some of the fellow members of the committee could at least maybe try and make that effort. I would appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed. Well, and if I can be to when? How long is it? Uh, Twelve o'clock uh, till quarter past one tomorrow. Quarter past one. Yeah. And Gordon Brown's on at. Gordon's on. He's on the last half hour. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Um, date and time of the next meeting, team, fourteenth uh, uh, of October, in here, at two o'clock. Okay. Uh, I'll now inform the meeting that we're now moving to closed session. Tenant Chamber, program signed.